What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If Spider Man Was in My Hero Academia? Part 2. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Also, remember to check out the original story linked in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. It was becoming more and more obvious to Peter that he couldn't ignore his lack of sleep like he normally did. Normally he could just push through the day, you know? Have some coffee in the morning for the energy and maybe even bring some to school, use May's makeup when his eye bags got too noticeable, and simply endure until he got home so he could crash for an hour or two before going on patrol for the day. This time around, it seemed like he couldn't hide it very well from the people around him. His classmates kept shooting him worried glances. Even Amajiki seemed to visibly show concern. Teachers for his normal classes like math and English asked him if he was alright every now and then which he quickly waved off. The day seemed to be a normal school one, with them selecting class representatives which went to both Togata and Hato along with Aizawa announcing the class would be going on a field trip on Friday to do some rescue training. When it was time for lunch was when it really started to dawn on him that he should have sat this one out. Even after downing his thermos filled with coffee, he couldn't keep his eyes fully open. Parker, you all right? Peter perked up where he sat at their table, next to Amajiki and in front of Hado. Focusing his eyes on the taller teen made him quickly realize that he must have been trying to get his attention for a bit. Looking around he could see Hado and Amajiki giving him concerned looks as they ate. Huh? What's up? Peter gave a small smile. It was tired and a pretty bad attempt to hide the fact that he was currently running a half hour of sleep. Hado looked at him and frowned, with Amajiki being the next one to speak. Why you look horrible, no offense. Did you G get any sleep last night? His voice was less anxious sounding than normal. Peter guessed it was a sign that he was getting comfortable around him and Hado. Rubbing his eyes, Peter gave a light shrug. I guess not. Had a nightmare that kept me up all night. A second of silence passed with Peter unconsciously running the scars that his rolled up sleeve left visible. These ones were some of the oldest he had and barely hurt anymore. But it's fine, I'll probably ask Aizawa if I can sit out if we do training today. Peter reassured, inwardly sighing at how his friends seemed to relax slightly at him saying he would take it easy. A small smile spread across his lips as he heard them talk regularly, if not a tiny bit tense. Rubbing his eyes, Peter looked straight ahead before Hado caught his attention by sliding a hand across to him. Do you want to talk about it? She asked, giving him the type of small smile you do when trying to convince a friend to open up. Tensing up, Peter held his hands up and shook his head. It's fine. Don't worry about it. He responded way too quickly, only getting a frown from his friend before she turned back to her food. He couldn't talk to them about the nightmare he had. They probably had better stuff to do anyway. At least better than listening about how he failed that girl. He didn't deserve that. Parker. Peter's head snapped up to look at Aizawa, the boy shaking his head to stay awake and take in his surroundings. This was homeroom, right? His three classmates and Aizawa were there so it must be. Looking up at the clock he could see it was around the time for heroics training. Aizawa gave the three remaining students a look, the teens hesitantly getting up and retrieving their suitcases from their lockers before leaving the room. Seeing this, Peter began to get up before being pushed back down onto his seat by a firm hand. You're sitting out from training today, and you're telling me what's going on. His teacher told him, lazily looking him over. He was sitting out? Thank God. In all honesty, Peter wasn't even meaning to ask Aizawa to sit out on training but guess he didn't have to. Wait, what was that second part? Kneeling down to Peter's height when sitting, the hero kept his hand on the boy's shoulder while holding a neutral expression. You look horrible, kid. What happened? Tensing up, Peter began to trace his fingers across the scars on his forearm like usual. Jay just a nightmare, you know? Didn't know you cared enough to be keeping an eye on me, scarf man. The chuckle that escaped him sounded dry and exhausted, 
It was a sad excuse of a chuckle now that Peter thought about it. So much for keeping it subtle. Huh? Looking over his features again, Aizawa sighed. Usually, you vex me. Well, I am known to be quite v dash. not today, you haven't even talked unless addressed. It is not like you, and it is illogical of me to try to get you to learn and improve in a state like that. The boy looked away. He could hear Aizawa rubbing his eyes with his free hand. You cannot learn to become a hero when there is obviously something bothering you this much. So we'll ask again, what happened? Peter bit the inside of his cheek, starting to bounce his leg while still not making eye contact. Should he even talk about this? He couldn't talk to May since she was busy at work, and he couldn't talk to his friends since they were busy doing training and stuff. But Aizawa? It was just the two of them in a room, with Peter not taking up the man's time in talking about what was going on. Looking at Aizawa, he could see the small bits of concern on his flat and neutral expression. Peter might as well, right? Taking a deep breath, Peter gave a small nod and rubbed his tired eyes to try and stay awake a bit longer. Seeing this, Aizawa stood back up and grabbed a chair from the desk next to them, placing it backward in front of Peter and sitting down. Well, remember how I said that I had a nightmare and all? Peter looked up from the desk and saw Aizawa nod. WL, it was about something that happened during my patrol. Before we met, the man asked, lacing his hands together as his arms hung over the back of the chair. It was about two months after I started so probably a few weeks before you showed up. The hero took in the information while keeping a neutral expression before he nodded, allowing his student to go on. There was this G-girl on a rooftop I came across, green hair and green eyes and dashed up. His throat started to tighten up as he willingly remembered her. He ran a hand through his messy brown hair before he continued. I T tried to help her, you know? God, I barely knew what to do. B but, a few tears fell from his eyes. Peter shut them as he gripped the fabric of his pants in frustration. Frustration mostly aimed at himself. Frustration for not being able to help her. She jumped, didn't she? Aizawa's voice was quiet but loud enough for Peter to hear. Looking up from the desk, he could see the man's expression had softened a bit. Peter looked into the man's eyes. I didn't even know her full name. Aizawa. I wasn't even F fast enough to catch her O or able to talk her OU out of it. The tears kept pouring down his cheeks. The room grew silent as Peter quietly sobbed. Have you talked to anyone about this, Parker? Hearing this, Peter cried harder for a second. I, I couldn't tell May or else she would F find out. If he pushed the memory A away, you know? I haven't thought about it for a few months. Peter continued to silently sob while occasionally sniffling as Aizawa kept silent, simply letting the boy cry. He was just so tired. He wanted to go to bed and get the day over with. He just wanted her to know he was sorry. YW was I the one there tea that night? Peter looked up once again and gave Aizawa a tired look, one that radiated both guilt and pure exhaustion. God, W-Y was I the O-1 there F for her? Aizawa didn't utter a single word, simply placing a firm yet comforting hand on the boy's shoulder. Peter cried harder. I, I want to help people, you can know? Fight the good fight and then just, just do my best T to make others' lives a bit better. I want to be able to save people while telling J jokes to L like, hide how freaking worried and scared I am so I can make them F feel safe. Why C couldn't I dash? Aizawa's face showed a hint of surprise for a moment before it reverted back to uninterest. Peter didn't notice either way. Peter simply hung his head low and quietly cried. His chest felt like it was being crushed as he tried to take deep breaths before he gave up and simply let his body keep breathing how it was. Why couldn't I help her? Peter asked in English, not bothering to switch to Japanese even if Aizawa seemed to understand. Still not speaking, Aizawa gripped Peter's shoulder a bit tighter to remind the boy he was there, God. Why couldn't I J just... Peter began, speaking in English once more before quickly descending into more quiet sobs. The hand on his shoulder gave a firm squeeze. Peter only cried harder. Why couldn't he just save her? Minutes passed like this, the clock ticking on the wall being the only sound in the room aside from Peter's quiet sobs and him occasionally muttering an apology in English. Aizawa sat there, his hand on the boy's shoulder, and did not utter a single word as he cried. 
The man let Peter sob, not trying to interrupt. The man let him cry, cry about something he shouldn't have been exposed to. He let him know he was there. Without saying a single word, he let Peter do what he should have been doing months before. He let him grieve, something Peter didn't even know he needed. The man let him cry, cry about something he shouldn't have been exposed to. He let him know he was there. Without saying a single word, he let Peter do what he should have been doing months before. He let him grieve, something Peter didn't even know he needed. Twenty minutes passed. The two simply sitting in the room as the clock ticked on the wall before the tears stopped falling and Peter finally felt air enter his lungs in something other than frantic breaths. That suffocating and constricting feeling in his chest had been lifted the slightest bit, but the most since when the nightmare woke him up. And although a part of him told him he deserved to feel like that, Peter couldn't help but sigh at how great it felt to have that weight lifted. Even if it was the slightest bit. Parker. Peter perked up where he sat. He wiped his puffy and red eyes before sniffling and looking up at Aizawa. Truth be told, he had forgotten his teacher was even there since the guy had barely said anything. Aizawa looked him over, eyes hanging over his features before letting out a sigh. You feel better, right? After letting it all out, the man asked, keeping his expression completely neutral. Peter thought about it, he couldn't help but admit he felt incredibly better than he did before. It felt like he could actually breathe right now. The boy simply nodded, rubbing his tired eyes while Aizawa nodded back. Like any other emotion does, crying releases a chemical into the brain. It makes you feel calm after you're done. That's why grieving is such an important thing to do when faced with things like that. Grieving? Peter wasn't too good at that now that he thought about it. The only time that he had to actively grieve about something was back when Ben died and he spent much of that time distracting himself with being Spider-Man, with the only time he actively grieved was after he got arrested and spent some time with May. He cried a lot during that, but he felt much better after. Was that what he should have been doing? Not a lot of heroes have to deal with situations like that, Parker. Most of the ones who do are underground heroes who are more likely to deal with darker types of crime and small-time things compared to villains destroying a city. You were a middle schooler who shouldn't have been exposed to that. Not only that, but you also completely ignored dealing with the traumatic experience you went through and thus further worsened its effect on your health. Nodding his head, the teen simply looked down. You need to understand that some of the things you saw and went through while still an active vigilante, things like gunfights and drug deals among others, take a great toll on a hero. Not responding, Peter only nodded while thinking about what Aizawa was saying. The more he listened to him, Peter began to realize that he may or may not have a few unresolved issues he has been ignoring. While you don't seem to have anything like PTSD, the guilt and trauma you have do need to be addressed so they don't worsen. I will contact both Nizu and your guardian about setting you up with weekly sessions with Hound Dog where you can actually address the things you've gone through. All right. Aizawa's voice still had that sense of neutralness and disinterest it always did. But Peter noticed it sounded gentler than normal. He wished Aizawa was on that rooftop that night. So, I have to get over it? The teen asked, tracing the scars on his forearms. What you need to do is to come to terms with both it and everything else like it. You need to understand that those things that happened were not your fault. You may be able to lift tons, but you are still both a human and a kid. You need time to feel better. The man said slowly. Peter didn't know what it was, but something Aizawa said made Peter burst into tears. They didn't feel sad, they just felt tired. They felt relieved. Wiping the tears away, Peter looked at Aizawa who still had his hand on his shoulder. Thanks. Peter gave a small smile, his eyes still puffy and red. Aizawa stood up from his chair and shoved his hands in his pockets. Peter simply sat there. Don't mention it, problem child. Peter raised an eyebrow at the new nickname. He guessed it was a form of showing affection at least in an Aizawa kind of way. So, what now? His teacher looked at him for a moment before responding. You go to recovery girl's office and you take a nap. I'll tell your friends you're all right and wake you up when you have to go home. And then, you grieve. You know what? That wasn't too bad of an idea. He was just so tired right now. Will you tell them about what happened? Peter asked, rolling his wrist and getting up from his seat. Only if you want me to, it's up to you. Thinking about it for a moment, Peter tried to decide on what to do. Friends told friends if something was up, right? 
He felt like he should do it himself, but didn't know if he had it in him to talk about what happened a second time. You can tell them, I just really need a nap. The boy gave a small laugh, grabbing his backpack from his locker and headed to the door. Sure, you're also excused from school tomorrow if you need more time. Whether you show up or not, it's up to you. Aizawa informed, the teen only nodding in response. Oh, and Parker? Aizawa's voice stopped him in his tracks, Peter turning around to face the tired man. If stuff like this happens again, please talk to your friends or your aunt. I am not good with this comfort type of thing. Peter couldn't help but chuckle at that. He waved a small goodbye that was only returned in a grunt and headed out the door. As he walked the halls towards the infirmary, the brunette reached into his pocket and pulled out his cracked phone. Opening up Google, Peter searched for suicide victims that fit into Mizuku's descriptions to maybe find out where they were buried. Paying her respects was probably going to help with the grieving process, right? He guessed it was a step towards coming to terms with it. Ditching the jacket was starting to become a better and better idea as the day went on. It was slowly starting to get warmer and warmer. It was one month before June anyway, he might as well ditch it before summer got started, right? Besides, he could just add it back with some small changes when he needed a winter costume. Clad in his hero suit minus the jacket he usually wore was Peter Parker, who was currently walking towards his homeroom teacher that was idly standing about 50 feet away from the bus. Peter had decided to remove it two days ago and had just got the all clear from the support department that the change was approved. It was going to be so annoying having to wait for someone to approve a change to his costume, you know? He was the one making it now. Today was Friday, the end of his first week at UA, and the day his class would go on some sort of rescue training field trip. Peter hadn't been paying much attention to Aizawa when he was talking about what they would do. But you couldn't blame him. After what had happened on Tuesday, that being the nightmare about Mizuku and his talk with Aizawa, the brunette had ended up taking both Wednesday and Thursday off to try and do what his teacher told him. Grieve. It was pretty rough at first, but he had to admit he felt better after taking those two days off to let his emotions out. Most of it was spent crying in his room, not really doing anything but he guesses that was part of the process. While he is still far from getting over, it he's getting there, at least he hopes he is. Continuing his pace, Peter soon came to stand beside the underground hero. Morning, scarf man. Peter greeted, putting his hands in his pockets. Peter would always be grateful for the support company not messing up his suit and making it skin tight. Who knows? Maybe there was an alternate universe version of him actually going around in a skin tight suit. Man, that guy must look like a loser. Switching his gaze from the bus to the boy next to him, Aizawa gave a hum before turning back to the bus. Parker, the man said flatly, Peter couldn't really read the guy's expression since his hair was covering his eyes. The two stood in silence for a bit more, Peter checking his phone and seeing they still had about two minutes before they had to get on the bus. Wait, wasn't All Might supposed to be here? Pretty sure Aizawa said something about that on Tuesday. Are you alright? His teacher asked, his tone somewhat gentler than normal but still flat and uninterested. Ah, that meant he cared. Probably. Smiling under the mask, Peter gave a small nod. I will be, I think. Thanks for helping me out and all, it really means a lot. I'll get you a mug as a gift or something soon. He couldn't help but throw in the joke at the end. But Aizawa didn't seem to mind. Have you talked to your aunt? Peter frowned, his lenses mimicking the expression. Yeah, we uh talked on the phone, but that's about it. She's busy with work in Tokyo, so we couldn't really see each other. The brunette watched Aizawa give a small frown at that. She doesn't live with you? And Peter might as well explain what was going on with that. He didn't want Aizawa getting the idea that May was a bad aunt or anything. You know? Well, she had to go live at an apartment she rented in Tokyo since her new job is there. And we kind of need the money, you know? That and she helps run the FEAST center over there. It happened after I got back from the exam, so it's... New for me. But I'm figuring it out. She should be able to visit in a couple of weeks anyway. Silently. Aizawa only nodded and looked away from his student with an unreadable expression. Peter smiled softly behind the mask, the boy standing by and rolling his shoulder. He enjoys their talks, although he did have a more serious question to ask. Hey, did you tell them about what happened? Peter asked, his voice low. 
Switching his gaze to Peter, Aizawa gave a nod. A weight that Peter didn't even know was there suddenly lifted off his shoulders. It was the most logical thing to do, so I told them both about the cause of your distress and your vigilante activity. Although they'll most likely not bring it up, you know what? That was good. While he didn't want to keep them in the dark or anything, a part of him didn't have it in him to tell them about all that stuff at once. Thanks, Aizawa. He smiled. Aizawa gave a short nod and turned back to the bus. Yeah, he was going to get him a mug to thank him for all he did the past few days. It's the least Peter could do, right? Field trip. The voice of Togata reached their ears, just in time for the blonde boy to pop out of the ground with a blinding smile. Honestly, he really missed his friends the past few days. Who knew Peter would be in a position to even say that? That spider not only gave him powers, but also a social life. What a wonder of science. Too bad he killed it, though. At least he's pretty sure he did. Field trip. Echoing his cry, Hato came flying in while carrying an embarrassed-looking Amajiki. Dropping him on the ground next to Togata, the girl did a loop in the air before landing next to Peter. He couldn't help but let a smile cross his face behind the mask. This was nice, you know? Hato was bouncing up and down in excitement while Togata was trying to hype up Amajiki for the coming exercise. Well, more like a field trip, because it was totally a field trip. All right, let's get going to the training location. Aizawa grumbled, beginning to usher in the teens onto the bus. And it is not a field trip. Peter, Togata, and Hato looked at each other for a moment. Amajiki idly standing by. Dude, it's totally a field trip. Peter chuckled, earning a few snickers from both Hato and Togata. Aizawa glared at him for what felt like ages. You three have detention for annoying me. Now let's go. Ah, uh, what? Why doesn't Tamaki? Amajiki looked between the three teens and Aizawa for a few seconds. Full-blown panic in his face. F-field trip. The man glared at the boy. Amajiki shrinking where he stood. Detention for Amajiki, too. Let's go. Aizawa rolled his eyes and stepped onto the bus. Yeah. Togata suddenly wrapped Amajiki in a bear hug and carried him to the bus while his friend, maybe more, hit his face with his hood. Peter and Hato stood there for a few seconds, simply watching them go before the brunette broke the silence. Am, am I the only one who feels like we're third-wheeling them? Because it feels like we are. Wait, really? I thought that was just me. They look super cute together, though. The girl laughed before starting to make her way to the bus her hair trailing behind her as she hovered towards the vehicle. Following behind, Peter tried to ignore the scent of apples her hair left behind the short way there. I always wanted to ask, Amajiki began, anxiously bouncing his leg as Togata sat next to him. What is in that backpack, Parker? They were on the bus now, sitting on the two continuous seats that faced each other that were towards the front, with Peter and Hato on one and Amajiki and Togata on the other. It brought him a sense of nostalgia, you know? Kind of reminded him of the subways back in New York. Reaching behind him, Peter grabbed the backpack and put it on his lap before opening it up. When designing it, he kind of made it to carry the items he may not need as frequently, while his belt had stuff like extra regular webbing cartridges, gauze, and bandages along with his phone. Reaching inside, Peter pulled out a spare set of web shooters and goggles. I got these in case I need a backup, you know? My lenses have a tendency to crack and my web shooters sometimes get crushed. Amajiki shrunk in his seat. Peter had honestly forgotten that the guy cracked his lenses with a coconut during the battle trial. In all honesty, he couldn't even be mad, you know? Getting hit with a coconut was super funny. And painful, it kinda rattled his teeth. Oh, oh, can I use your web thingies? I always wanted to. Hato began bouncing up and down, Peter throwing one of the wrist devices at her the girl catching it and snapping it on. Surprisingly, she actually fired a web that Togata phased through while playing with the line, no one ever thinks to double tap. Suddenly, the four jumped at Aizawa yelling at them to not use support gear on the bus. But, who was it gonna distract? The driver? It was a literal robot from the exam wearing a hat that said, bus driver on it. Scarf man was just being unfun. Throwing the goggles and web shooters back into the bag, Peter then pulled out a few web cartridges that he held between his fingers. The word, cement, 
was written on them in bold English letters. These are some quick dry cement webs. Have M saved up if I need to reinforce a building since they dry up when exposed to air and become pretty durable. But I can't use them as my regular webs since they take like 13 hours to dissolve and don't get affected by my regular dissolvent. He threw the cartridges back into their respective pockets inside the bag. Kato leaned towards Peter and started to peek inside it. Yeah, he was gonna ignore how close she was. Which was incredibly close, by the way. He was just gonna ignore that he threw the cartridges back into their respective pockets inside the bag. Kato leaned towards Peter and started to peek inside it. Yeah, he was gonna ignore how close she was. Which was incredibly close, by the way. He was just gonna ignore that. Rummaging through the bag, Peter ignored the stress ball that had somehow found its way inside before pulling out what looked to be a see-through plastic container that had a clear liquid filling it and the cap of a spray can. Shaking it, Peter sprayed it on the line of webbing that Hato had shot earlier, the group watching as it dissolved into nothing. Whoa, cool. So you just carry that in case you need to get rid of the webs, right? Togata tried looking at the floor to try to find something that was left of the web, only to give up after finding nothing. Peter nodded and smiled behind the mask, throwing the can back inside the backpack. Reaching back inside, Peter pulled out a camera and a black flip phone. Emajiki tilted his head in confusion. Why do why you have those? He asked. The two other teens looked at the objects with equal levels of confusion. Oh, the camera is for my job. I kind of need money so I work as a freelance photographer for a newspaper. I just take pictures of heroes or big villain attacks that happen. Peter looked at the camera in his hand, giving a small smile before putting it back into the bag. He had found it on a rooftop when swinging back home from one of his daytime patrols conveniently next to an ad that said that the newspaper he works at was hiring. It was apparently one of the best cameras from the 21st century. Why the phone, though? I've seen you with a phone before. Hato reached into the bag and pulled out the spare goggles, the girl toying around with the lenses. Peter didn't care, he could repair them anyway. Well, just in case I need to call the police, you know? I can take the battery out so they don't track me while I get out of there. A beat of silence sounded through the bus, his friends looking at him as if he was stupid. That's exactly when it hit him. Wait, I'm doing this legally now. He wasn't a criminal anymore. He completely forgot. Why would a hero need to escape the police after capturing a villain? Man, he felt kind of stupid now. Now that he thought about it, that's probably why the idea for spare clothes in the bag was rejected by the support company since Peter had added them in case he needed to get out of costume. It'd take time to get used to that. That and the fact that both Togata and Emajiki knew now, but Peter could handle that. Putting the objects back in the bag and making a mental note to throw the phone away, Peter pulled out the last items. It was a black hardcover notebook with a sticker of a red version of Peter's spider symbol around the lower right. On Peter's other hand was a set of sticky notes and a few pens of different colors. Opening it up was a mess of notes and sketches for many different things, some being gadget ideas, chemical formulas, or costume designs and materials. Your handwriting kind of sucks. The girl beside him squinted at the notes, Peter noticing that she was now wearing his goggles. Pulling them off her and putting them back in the backpack, Kato gasped at her vision changing. Oh, now it looks normal. Your goggles make stuff look weird. Peter only rolled his eyes, handing the notebook to the girl and throwing the sticky notes and pens back into the bag. Togata stood up and sat next to Hato, looking at the book with Amajiki following suit. Wait, how were they reading that stuff? It was in English. Although, didn't Japanese schools teach English? It must be like the Spanish classes he took in middle school. Except with a different alphabet because Japanese was a weird language like that. Flipping through the book, the three scanned over the different pages of the book, flipping through the random assortment of scribbles and random post-it notes until coming across a specific page. Hato looked up at him while doing her best to hold in her laughter, Amajik, and Togata doing the same while Peter only raised an eyebrow behind the mask. Did you really design a spider mobile? Peter froze, groaning and dragging his hands through his face. I was going through a phase, all right? Designing the spider mobile was not a fond memory for him, that nor the fact that he did it while running on two hours of sleep, it was either the lack of sleep or the painkillers he took the night before after he got shot making him woozy that made his brain come up with the spider mobile. Can't why you climb walls? Why would you need a car? 
Amajiki questioned, looking at Peter over Togata's shoulder. Man, it was a cool idea at the time. Shut up. Togata snorted, reaching over and giving Peter a strong pat on the back. Whatever you say, Batman. Having friends was not as cool as it was about 15 minutes ago. A spider mobile would be way cooler than the Batmobile, anyway. Wiping a tear from her eye, Kato turned the page again before they all burst into laughter. Aizawa Sensei, Parker designed a spider copter. The blonde called between laughs. Peter could easily see Amajiki chuckling quietly as Hado took a picture on her phone. The masked teen simply shrunk in his seat while covering his face with his hands. They won't be laughing when he actually gets the spider mobile. Peter was sure of it. Welcome, children, to the USJ. The astronaut-looking hero greeted. Peter couldn't help but let his lenses go wide. That was the space hero, 13. Peter got to meet them once when he visited a space museum when he was seven. They even signed an autograph for him. From what he knew, not only were they a renowned rescue hero and had a powerful quirk, they even helped with things like space research. Pretty sure 13 even helped out NASA every now and then. All in all, 13 was pretty cool. And from the way that Hado and Togata were gushing about meeting them, his friends thought the same. Even Amajiki seemed excited. Aizawa was standing next to the rescue hero, simply tapping his foot impatiently for his students to settle down. Took about two minutes, but could you blame them? Yes, yes. I am always glad to meet young fans. As you kids know, I am the Space Hero 13, UA's resident rescue expert. Additionally, we have a special guest to supervise training. His spider sense rang lightly, just in time for Peter to turn around and see the front door to the facility slam open and hear the booming laugh that echoed through the facility. I am here. All Might boomed, flipping through the air and landing in between Aizawa and Thirteen before proudly standing before the teens while Aizawa groaned in annoyance. Oh, that's where he was. The guy really liked the flair in things, huh? Well, Peter was pretty much the same. He was a showman at heart, after all. Thirteen waved a hand at All Might to present their guest instructor, the tall man simply grinning and flexing in his yellow pinstripe suit. Peter paused, eyes lingering on the suit. Had he seen it before? Before he could try to piece it together, All Might clapped his hands together to get the teen's attention while Aizawa lazily held out a card with the word, Rescue, on it. I hope you kids are ready. For today, we shall get started on some rescue training. While combat gets more general coverage, rescue work is the other side of the coin of being a hero. One must know how to save civilians and act accordingly in respective disasters. Young heroes, All Might laughed with 13 following up. All Might is correct. Rescue work is a huge part of being a hero for it involves interacting with civilians the most. While some quirks are better for either combat or rescue, to be a good hero you must know to do both. Today, we will be doing some disaster rescue. Disaster rescue? Looking past the three heroes and into the USJ, Peter could easily see what must be different types of zones scattered around. He guessed it was to emulate different situations. All in all, it seemed cool. Peter always rescuing and saving people more than fighting. Anyway, seeing the two other heroes looking at him, Aizawa sighed and rolled his eyes, running a hand through his messy hair and reluctantly following up. As you all may know, the USJ was specifically designed by UA to emulate natural disasters and rescue situations, such as collapsing buildings and landslides. Today, you shall start off in rescuing someone in the ruined zone. Any questions? Pointing with his thumb behind him, Aizawa presented an area with what looked to be several buildings in different types of decay, with some of them barely staying up and off the ground. That seemed unsafe for some reason, you know? At UA probably knew what they were doing. Hopefully. Pointing with his thumb behind him, Aizawa presented an area with what looked to be several buildings in different types of decay, with some of them barely staying up and off the ground. That seemed unsafe for some reason, you know? At UA probably knew what they were doing. Hopefully. Aizawa looked the four teens over, his eyes finally landing on the barely raised hand of Amajiki, who shrunk where he stood at seeing everyone looking at him. You, uh, who W will we be are rescuing, S-sensei? He asked, getting a sigh and an eye roll from the man. 
Peter simply raised an eyebrow at the response, the four teens watching as he gestured to the man beside him. Grinning wider, all might flexed again. That's a very good question, my boy. If you must know Dash, he pointed towards himself, puffing his chest out. You kids shall be rescuing none other than me. The students stood silent and stared at him. Peter couldn't help but let out an accepting sigh. Please tell him he wouldn't have to carry All Might out of a falling building. After a reluctant nod from Amajiki, All Might laughed loudly and made everyone in the facility wince. Why did he have to be so loud? Your exercise is to find All Might somewhere in the ruined zone and get him back to the starting area safely and in one piece. 13 and I will be there to make sure no one gets seriously hurt. Understood? Aizawa announced, grabbing a bottle of eye drops from his pocket and casually applying it. Peter raised his hand, quickly getting called on by the man. Uh, I know this is an exercise and all but can't All Might shrug off buildings falling on him? Why aren't we rescuing someone who, you know, can't do that? He asked, getting an annoyed look in return. Something told him that Aizawa didn't agree to this whole thing with All Might. Now that he thought about it, did Scarf Man even like the guy? Aizawa rolled his eyes again before responding. Pure and utter irrationality. Uh, all right then. Cool. The students began to get ready for the exercise to start. Peter and Emajiki tightening their vests while Hado and Togata simply began to concentrate on their quirks, with Hado going a few inches off of the ground. Now, remember, this is disaster rescue training. You shall learn every other type of rescue when the time comes. Rescue can even mean saving someone from things like muggings and even suicide. I dash, once those words reached his ears, memories began to flash in his mind. A masked boy stood on a rooftop in front of a hooded girl edging closer towards the ledge. The memory flashed to the boy screaming into the night as he sobbed and gripped his mask tightly, alone on the roof. Peter coughed as his breath hitched, the boy looking away while gritting his teeth so as to not show a reaction. His gloved hand balled into a tight fist as his body tensed, that familiar suffocating feeling beginning to surround his chest. While he grieved, he still hadn't forgiven himself for what happened that night or completely come to terms with the memory. He still needed more time. A lot more time. Peter was sure All Might was still talking about something. But the world seemed drowned out with only a few words being able to be heard by the boy. Beginning to take deep breaths, the crushing feeling in his chest began to slowly dissipate, but it didn't fully disappear. A few seconds passed before Peter finally turned back to the heroes, muscles still tight. Everyone except Thirteen was glaring at All Might, the man seemingly not realizing anything was going on as he continued his speech on whatever. Now, Peter knew he couldn't blame him, you know? He didn't know, but it was still hard being reminded of what happened. Intentionally or not. Yeah, he was gonna call May when he got home. Soon enough, All Might finally finished talking and gave one last oblivious laugh before jumping away and towards the ruined zone, disappearing amongst the buildings. All right, he needed to focus. He just, just needed to finish today and we'll get back to grieving right after. You all may start, and good luck, Aizawa announced, his voice sounding a bit more miffed than usual as he started a timer. Shaking his head, Peter turned to the side to see his three classmates getting ready to go, with Togata ready to phase and Hado beginning to pick up Amajiki. They all looked a bit reluctant if he was being honest, simply waiting to make sure he could still do the rescue. All Peter could do was give a silent nod and push the thoughts to the back of his mind for now. Quickly holding out his right wrist and tapping the trigger, Peter shot a web that stuck to the USJ's ceiling and began to swing away toward the ruined zone. Looking back, he could see Togata phasing his way toward the zone while Hado flew herself and Emajiki the way there. As the buildings drew closer while he swung, he couldn't help but let out a sigh of relief at the chance to distract himself for a bit. It couldn't hurt to swing around buildings a little bit to calm himself down, all there was left to do was find All Might. Landing softly on the side of a stable-looking seven-story building, Peter took a few seconds to take deep breaths to try and alleviate the suffocating feeling that lingered in his chest. That familiar feeling of his fingertips sticking to concrete did help calm his nerves. Wall crawling and web slinging were always some of his best ways to calm down every now and then. It made him feel in control, he guessed. Being Spider-Man gave him a chance to not worry about Peter Parker's problems sometimes, you know? It gave him the chance to just swing around and do some good, 
to deal with things more important than grief or sleep deprivation. Now, he knew that normally heroes don't separate themselves when they're either in or out of costume, but Peter couldn't help it. That's what the hyphen between the spider and the man was for anyway. It separated them. Spider-Man and Peter Parker are two different people, at least that's how it's always been. That's how it'll probably stay. Yikes, that didn't sound healthy. Uh, he'd worry about it later and deal with it. Probably. He should probably talk to May about this stuff, too. That'd come later. All he had to do was find All Might and be done with the exercise. A part of him hoped his classmates would find the guy first. Turning his back to the wall, he stuck to it with both his hands and feet before scanning around the area he was in. From the view he got when swinging, the zone looked about one to two city blocks big, mostly composed of buildings in different states of decay and that ranged from four to thirteen floors. He could work with that, just start from the higher places, work your way down and look for the civilian. Just like he always does, or used to do anyway. Shooting a web, Peter flipped off the building and swung down the street, using rusty lamp posts to pick up speed as he neared the tallest building close by. As he swung, a familiar vibration in the back of his skull made him turn to the side only for his vision to be filled with a sea of periwinkle hair and golden sparkles. You know, he was starting to wonder when someone would show up. Hey, I've never seen you swing in person before. Wait, do you think you could teach me? Hato commented, twirling in the air as she flew at a pace that matched his own. I would but I can't let you steal my shtick, you know? The smile behind his mask was relieved at finally having someone to talk to. Swinging got lonely sometimes. The two teens flew down the street before finally reaching the tallest building. It looked as if the top left of it had simply crumbled and fallen to the street, covering it in chunks of debris. Man, hopefully All Might wasn't in there, or under there now that he thought about it. Landing on the wall, Peter began to walk on it upright while Hato flew alongside him. Turning back to the street, he could easily see Togata phasing in and out of buildings quickly before his eyes landed on Amajiki. He froze. The boy had transformed his hands and feet into amphibian-looking ones, maybe from a frog, and was climbing up the wall of a building. His lenses narrowed. Hey! Amajiki! Peter yelled, his classmate nervously looking back at him. Wall crawling's my shtick. You start spinning a web and I'll sue. Amajiki simply nervously nodded and dipped into the small building he was on. Can't believe he would steal his shtick. When you think you know someone, a snort from beside caught his attention, making his run to meet Hato's eye. Was that really necessary? She giggled, Peter nodding and walking up the building with her following. You don't see me shooting lasers, right? That's your thing, and wall crawling's my thing. Peter shrugged, smiling at the laugh that Hato gave off. Making light conversation, the two made their way up the building until finally reaching the highest point, the half-destroyed twelfth floor. Just as Peter crawled inside a building, he turned back to see Hato still there. Why was she still here? Shouldn't they be looking for All Might? Now that he thought about it, wasn't he the only one that could actually pick him up? Uh, you alright? Looking down for a second, she met his eyes. You're okay, right? With the stuff All Might said? Sorry to like, bring it up so soon, but I just wanted to make sure. Oh, that's why she was still there. A soft smile appeared on his lips behind the mask, with Peter taking it and the goggles off for a second. Yeah, I'll be fine. Thanks for checking in and all. A look of pure relief spread across her face, the girl giving a small chuckle. Oh, good. Honestly, the plan was for togata -kun to be the one to talk to you, but he kinda lost you with all the swinging you were doing. Peter couldn't even help the laugh that escaped him. The boy leaning on the window frame he had just come in from. A part of him felt a bit stupid since about 80% of the floor was exposed, with the wall the window was on barely holding up. Wait, why did he even enter through a window? Probably the force of habit, now that he thought about it. So, race you to finding All Might? He asked, a small smirk on his face as he pulled the mask and goggles over his face, hiding his features. Her face lit up almost immediately, blue eyes shining with excitement as she nodded up and down. You're on. Hearing this, Peter gave a thumbs up before he started to head deeper into the building. Oh wait, I forgot I needed to ask you something. 
Hato flew through the window and ended up floating right next to him before landing. You wanna have a sleepover with Togata Kuin and Amajiki Kuin? It'd be fun. Wait, did she say sleepover? Like, where you go over to someone's house and sleep there? Well, it was in the name, so it probably was that. I've never been to a sleepover, you sure? The gasp that Hato let out took what seemed to be a full minute. Part of him felt the need to make sure she could still, you know, breathe and all. You've never been to a sleepover? Peter slowly nodded. The girl let out another gasp that was slightly longer than the last one. Well, I can't have that. I'll text you about it later. We gotta find all might. With that, the girl hopped off the ground and started to hover just off of it before shooting out of the window. Peter stood by, watching her fly by as the sparkles around him slowly turned to nothing. I didn't even agree. A face popped out of the cracked concrete wall beside him. Peter didn't even stop crawling on the ceiling. Found him yet? Togata asked. Peter simply shook his head in response. No, I've gone through this building twice already and nothing. What about you? Fully phasing through the wall and onto the hallway Peter was in. He watched as his classmate shook his head. Nah, and neither has Tamaki, so I've been starting to look through the rubble. Yeah, that did make more sense. He wasn't too knowledgeable about the proper way to do hero stuff, so he's kind of been going with his gut with the small hope his spider sense would let him know if he was near All Might. But the idea of most victims being under the rubble rather than in buildings did sound right. Maybe. He wasn't too sure on this whole thing, now that he thought about it. Wait, why didn't Aizawa even tell them how to go about this? Maybe All Might wasn't the only bad teacher here. Peter nodded and hopped down to the ground and stretched, sighing as his bones popped. Hey, I always wanted to ask. Peter began, rolling his shoulders. Are you and Amajiki a thing? Togata did a double take while his eyes went wide but Peter could easily spot the lightest blush on his cheeks. What, me and Tamaki? No, we'd never. You know, he laughed nervously while rubbing the back of his neck. The brunette stared at him for a moment. Neither of the two moving before Togata awkwardly phased through the wall he had come from. All right. Then, shrugging off the interaction, Peter started to walk down the hall and out of the building. Stepping out of the building, Peter could easily see Hato flying all over the place while looking for their teacher, while Amajiki used tentacles to move pieces of rubble around. Well, they seemed to have the right idea. Turning his head to the safe point, he saw both Aizawa and Thirteen simply standing by, with Aizawa holding a clipboard in his hands as he eyed the class. The thought of asking Aizawa where All Might was passed through his mind before quickly being waved off. Their teacher wasn't one to provide help. Just as he was about to shoot a web, the sound of shifting rubble caught his attention and made his spider sense ring lightly. He was right behind him, wasn't he? Hey, young Parker. The voice of All Might came, nearly a whisper. It was probably the quietest Peter had ever heard the man talk. Either way, Peter couldn't help but flinch at hearing his voice. It brought his mention of suicide earlier to the forefront of his mind before he pushed it away again. He just needed to get done with the exercise. Then he could start to grieve again. Shaking his head, Peter took in a deep breath before finally feeling the tension in his muscles fade. Turning around, the teen was met by the odd sight of the symbol of peace buried in rubble with only his feet and head visible. The man simply laying on the ground with his arms behind his head and a grin on his face. All in all, he didn't seem too bothered by the blanket of debris on him. Ah, uh, hey! He greeted cautiously, slowly walking over to the hero. You? Okay. There? All Might chuckled. A far cry from the booming laughter he normally did. Why no? For I, a mere defenseless civilian, have been caught in this terrible disaster and had a building fall on me. Rendering me unable to move, All Might chuckled, a far cry from the booming laughter he normally did. Why no? For I, a mere defenseless civilian, have been caught in this terrible disaster and had a building fall on me, rendering me unable to move. He was role-playing this. Yikes. Slowly nodding, Peter told the civilian to wait there while he got a hold of everyone. Hey guys, get over here. I found him. Cupping his hands over his mouth, Peter yelled through the zone and watched as his classmates came running. Togata quickly popped out of the ground next to Peter, 
with Amajiki using bird-like wings on his back to glide out of a window and Hato flying over to them. Also, since when can Amajiki get wings? Why you found him? Amajiki asked, his wings quickly disappearing. Only nodding, Peter pointed his thumb behind him toward the laying form of All Might, who had not moved an inch. Also, I think he's role-playing being a civilian or something. His classmates cringed. Peter couldn't help but understand. Wait, so how do we get him out? The blue-haired girl asked, shooting up a few inches of the ground and cupping her chin. Well, Amajiki and I should be able to get most of the rubble off and you guys can help with that. Sounds good? Seeing his friends nod in agreement, Peter began to lead them over to where All Might was. Once they got there, their teacher let out a booming laugh that made Peter wince. He hated his enhanced senses sometimes. Why? It is a miracle. It appears that these young heroes have finally come to rescue me. Huzzah! The man laughed. It was so loud that it knocked some of the smaller rocks off of the top of the pile on accident. Oh, he's really role-playing. Hato muttered from beside him. He could only give her a side glance before he and Amajiki started to throw the debris off of the man took what felt like a few minutes, but they managed to fully free the man. Just as the last of the rubble was thrown off of him, the hero began to roll around in an act of incredibly fake agony. It was hard to not get secondhand embarrassment, you know? He was pretty sure heroes back in New York weren't as dorky. Uh, are you hurt, sir? Kneeling down, Togata looked over the rolling form of All Might before looking at his classmates for help. Oh, I sure am. Some of that dastardly debris must have injured my leg. Oh, please tell me you heroes have bandages. He cried, all the while keeping that grin on his face. It was just so bizarre. Oh, um, sure. Quickly, Hato reached into one of the satchels around her thigh and pulled out a roll of white bandages before kneeling down next to Togata and beginning to apply it. You know, part of him actually thought those satchels she had didn't even carry anything. In all honesty, the only time Peter had ever seen a hero pull something out of a pouch was when Aizawa threw those smoke bombs at him that one time. And Peter hadn't even seen the pouch they come from. And done, she exclaimed, rising from the ground while Togata did the same. All Might, having returned to laying on the ground as if nothing happened, began to laugh. Excellent. Thank you for applying first aid to my leg, young heroes. Now, I believe the next course of action would be for you to get me to safety. But unfortunately, I cannot move. He was going to carry him, wasn't he? Rolling his eyes, his lenses mimicking the motion, Peter wordlessly stepped forward and took the man into his arms in a bridal carry. Thank you, young Parker. All Might sounded a bit off guard but tried to keep his normal attitude. Let's just get this over with. This was not going to be a memory Peter would like to remember. Besides, he could barely see over the person he was carrying. As Peter jogged towards the safe zone, all might in his arms, Hato flew beside him while laughing and taking pictures on her phone, with Togata and Emajiki snickering on his other side. Why are you guys even like this? Cause you look stupid. Hato laughed, flying all around him. Looking down, Peter couldn't help but notice the almost reminiscent look the man had as he muttered something about youth. Also, he looked way more familiar than he probably should. Wait, he can speak English, right? He's seen him speaking it in things like interviews. Maybe he should just ask him, you know? Might be worth a shot. Hey, all might. Peter started speaking in English while his friends began to talk to each other. Have we met before? Like, in person? All might's eyes went wide as nervous sweat began to pour down his face. His sunken eyes started to dart around before he let out an awkward chuckle. You, uh, I do not believe so, no. Why do you a ask? The man answered, speaking in near-perfect English with only a small accent being noticeable. Nothing. It's just that I felt like I've seen someone wearing that suit before. The boy shrugged, simply turning his eyes to the approaching starting area where Aizawa and Thirteen stood waiting. Even so, he couldn't miss the tension in All Might's body as he carried the man. Quickly, the group finally reached the starting area of the ruined zone, with Peter letting All Might back onto his feet and then standing in front of Aizawa and Thirteen with the rest of his class. All Might walked over to his fellow teachers, 
then cleared his throat. Well, good job, students. Very well done. His voice still sounded tense. Peter couldn't help but wonder why. Sighing, Aizawa decided to follow up. Yeah, you all did fine. All used their better mobility to get to both vantage points and places where civilians could have been stuck. Even though you did waste a bit of time making conversation. But talking was his whole thing. Next up was 13, who quickly held up a thumbs up while the eyes on their helmet emoted to show a satisfied smile. Yes, you all did wonderfully. Incredibly well for the first time you conducted any sort of disaster rescue. Not only that, but Hato's application of the bandage was good. All in all, not bad children. A hand was shoved towards him. Peter didn't even hesitate to high-five the girl who pumped her other fist into the air in pride. He wasn't gonna lie, the smile she had at that moment was kinda cute. Wait, how long did they spend looking for All Might? Felt like around 20 minutes? Tops? From what he remembered, classes were always about 50 minutes. What else were they gonna do for the next 30? Alright, listen up. Aizawa began, catching everyone's attention. Take five minutes to rest, and then you will have 20 minutes to rescue All Might along with some dummies from the flood zone. Huh? What dummies? Right on cue, a hole on the ceiling right above the water of the flood zone opened up and dropped what looked like 60 dummies with a big splash and then closed. Oh those. Wait, what about All Might? Shouldn't you be somewhere? Aizawa growled towards the taller man, making him perk up and leap away, landing with another big splash. There we go. Get to it. Just like that, Aizawa and 13 began walking towards the splash zone while their students scrambled away. So, anyone here any good at swimming? Togata asked, standing by the edge of the water next to his classmates. Peter had to admit, the sight of All Might floating around face up while surrounded by a bunch of training dummies was incredibly weird. This year was going to be like this, wasn't it? Not really? Haven't gone to a pool in a while. Hato responded, cupping her chin while still floating off the ground. Shrugging, Peter followed up. I fell into the Hudson River while trying to save a car from falling off a bridge once and almost drowned. So not really. Looking to the side, he could see his classmates looking at him with small bits of concern, which was kinda understandable. Although it was crazy how falling into that river didn't give him superpowers or make him radioactive. Well, more superpowers than he already had. Or more radioactive, but he still wasn't too sure about that. Probably shouldn't be donating any blood before he figures out that little thing. Doesn't matter? I'll tell you about that some other time. Amajiki? Please tell me you can manifest fins or something? Amajiki perked up at being addressed before nodding and opening a pouch of his carrier vest with what Peter thinks was the word, salmon, written in kanji. Pulling out a small piece of salmon and eating it, they watched as Amajiki took off both his hood and cape before growing gills and diving into the water. Ha! Huh. I didn't even know he could do that. Togata laughed, already in the process of taking off his cape to jump into the water. As Peter was about to say something, his eyes widened at the fact that some of the dummies were starting to think into the water, which, in all honesty, wasn't too good of a thing to be happening. Crap! Some of them are sinking. Uh, Togata, go in and swim some of them back to shore. I'll swing in and get all my... Hato will fly some of them out of the water. Let's go. Not waiting for a response, Peter shot two webs at the side of the massive boat in the middle of the water and took a few steps back before slingshotting himself forwards. Sticking to the side of the ship and climbing up to the deck, he flicked his wrists and shot out the now empty cartridges before inserting new ones from his belt. Now that he thought about it, he should probably swing by the short department and make some more cartridges. Who knew they'd have a chemistry set no one used? Also, S swing. Get it? He should probably focus. His lenses scanned over the water's surface, watching as Amajiki dove down and grabbed many of the sinking dummies with the tentacles that replaced his hands. Hato had begun flying back and forth while carrying two dummies under each arm before repeating the process while Togata simply swam to shore while carrying one on his back before going back. Well, they weren't doing bad. Shooting a web line at All Might's chest, Peter began to pull the floating man towards him. Come on, big guy, I got you. You know, again. Pulling him up, Peter hoisted the man onto his back, 
grabbing him with one arm for support and shooting a web with his other. The hero's body was still tense for reasons Peter didn't know. Quickly, he pushed off of the boat by his feet and began his swing back to shore, trying his best to not do unnecessary tricks with someone on his back. Last time he tried that he got cursed out, which wasn't fun. That lady cursed him out for like half an hour even though he pulled her kid out of a burning building. How was he supposed to know he got motion sick easily? The feeling of his feet landing on the ground brought him back to reality. Quickly, he sat all might down and tried to think of what to do next. There was a chance that the guy would try to roleplay drowning or something like that, right? Oh, he hoped not. Uh, you alright? No wacky stuff going on. Peter asked, kneeling down to All Might's sitting height. The man simply grinned and flexed, accidentally sending some of the water on his suit onto Peter's goggles. Man, they were gonna be blurry now. I am completely fine, my boy. Thank you for the rescue. Quite the splendid job. It has been a while since I've had someone be able to lift me. Young man, does your cork give you any type of strength enhancement? His voice was cautious at the end almost sounding as if he was dreading an answer. All in all, Peter was confused. Why would All Might ask a question like that out of left field? Well, it gives me the proportionate abilities of a spider, like how they can lift 60 times their weight. It makes me able to lift a few tons. All Might's eyes narrowed slightly in a sense of suspicion Peter couldn't understand. Quite strange that an animal-based quirk gives you such an extreme version of their abilities. And yet, without any physical mutations, the grin on his face was becoming increasingly forced. Peter couldn't help but start to become a bit uncomfortable. I guess? Look man, I gotta get back to the exercise. Peter quickly rose back up to his feet, shooting a web at the side of the boat without taking his eyes off of All Might. Oh, of course. Sorry about that, I suppose I just got curious. All Might laughed a fake laugh. The boy standing there for a moment before pulling himself back towards the boat. Alright, what was that about? First with what All Might said when they got to USJ and now this, Peter was starting to get less and less comfortable around the guy. Cause while he's still new to the whole legit hero thing, he was pretty sure that doing a semi-interrogation out of nowhere wasn't too common. But whatever, he just needs to get done with the exercise and forget about it. As Peter stuck back on the side of the boat, he began to shoot web lines at the nearby dummies and pull them over his shoulder. Hey, Hato, he called, making the girl fly up to him just as she finished dropping off three dummies on the shore. How many of these do we have left? To be honest, I kind of lost count at 28. She shrugged, and Peter couldn't blame her. All right, just take these while I grab a few more. As the girl took the civilians out of his arms and into hers, Peter got an idea. Suddenly, he began to shoot webs connecting the side of the boat to shore, connecting the lines to each other to make a semi-flat surface, creating a makeshift web slide for dummies to go on. So cool. He should probably practice on making more web constructs. Oh cool. Slide. Hato laughed, dropping the dummies in her arms and watching them slide to shore. Man, now Peter wanted to try it out. Togata, give Hato your dummy so we can get them to shore faster. Also, do you know how many we have left? Peter called, the blonde boy in the water perking up and handing the girl the dummy he was carrying. Sure thing. Also, I think we're at 58. 58? Where's the last one? Out of nowhere, Amajiki rose from the water with a dummy on his back while looking out of breath. Wait, how do you lose your breath underwater? H here, Amajiki announced letting Peter pull the dummy onto his arms with a web before sending it down the slide along with the one Hato had. And that should do it. Rescue done. Oh, please tell him they were done. Walking up to the shore and standing before them were Aizawa and Thirteen, with the tired-looking man helping All Might back up to his feet. Thirteen began clapping, the eyes on their helmet portraying a happy expression as All Might clapped along and Aizawa rolled his eyes. Bravo. Well done, students. You all did truly wonderfully rescuing the fake civilians along with All Might. Congrats on completing today's rescue exercise. Oh thank god they were done. Peter really wanted to go home right about now. Cracking his neck, Aizawa followed up. Yes, a job well done to all of you. 
everyone played to their strengths and helped out even if their skill set wasn't suited to water rescues. And the creativity that Parker demonstrated with the slide at the end is exactly what I look for in heroes. Peter grinned, taking off both his mark and goggles before returning the high five Hado offered without even looking. Anything to add? All Might? Aizawa asked, his voice still sounding miffed at the man. All Might's blue eyes trailed towards Peter, narrowing when finally landing on him before the man forced a grin. I do not believe I have anything to add. Aizawa. They all did marvelously. Nodding, the underground hero wrote some things down in his clipboard and checked the stopwatch in his hand before looking up and grinning. What scared Peter was that it was the same grin he had during his acceptance letter and the quirk test. Change of plans, you only took seven minutes to complete the exercise, so we still have a little less than half an hour left of class. Aizawa began. The brunette dreaded what he was going to say next. So we'll do one lady exercise. Get yourself to the conflagration zone and get to it. All Might simply leaped away and stepped into the zone, while Peter reluctantly put his mask and goggles back on. Yeah, he wasn't going to get him that mug anymore. The scent of apples invaded his senses, along with the feeling of hair on his face. Also, why was he sleeping on the floor? It felt like he was in between two people, having the distinct feeling of someone grabbing his arm. Keeping his eyes closed, Peter moved to the side, accidentally bumping into something that gave a tired groan. Trying to move in the other direction resulted in bumping into something that gave a grunt that sounded more feminine. All right, what? Either he was kidnapped or something else entirely. Opening his eyes, Peter finally saw the color of the sea of hair that was on him. Periwinkle. It was Hado, wasn't it? Looking over to the side, he saw his friend fast asleep while having his arm locked in a grip that seemed way too strong for her to have. Her hair was a complete and total mess, splayed out all around her and in a series of knots but she didn't seem to mind. Peter's face grew a bit hotter when realizing what was happening, only to grow even hotter when noticing how her hot breath felt against his skin. Wait, why was she on his floor? Or in his house? Or grabbing his arm? Looking to the other side, he was met with what was unmistakably Togata's broad back, the boy also seeming to be asleep. Wait, where was Amajiki? Leaning up onto his elbow as much as he could, Peter looked over Togata's side only to see Amajiki in his arms, seeming content. Ha, huh, they were starting to seem less and less platonic every day. Well, that's all three of his friends sleeping in what was unmistakably his room incredibly early in the morning given how there was no light coming through the window. But why? And how? Today was Saturday, right? They had that rescue field trip yesterday where they went to the USJ. Wait, Hato told him something about a sleepover, right? Peter was pretty sure it was when they were in the ruin zone. Oh, sleepover. That's why his friends were sleeping on his floor. Yeah, that makes way more sense than him getting kidnapped. Peter brushed the mass of hair away from his face and tried to sit up before quickly realizing Hato was still holding his arm, the movement making the girl lean closer. He had a feeling she wasn't a morning person so maybe he shouldn't wake her up. If she was anything like May early in the morning then that was his best bet. Carefully, Peter began to slide his arm away from Hato, making the girl grab his forearm instead. Her hand accidentally touched one of his more sensitive scars, making him wince suck in air through his teeth as quietly as he could. That was going to be stinging all day now, wasn't it? Now even more careful. Peter slipped out of Hato's hold and watched as the girl pouted in her sleep. You know, she looked kind of cute asleep. All right, he should probably get started on the day since he probably wasn't going back to sleep. Even if he desperately wanted to, pretty sure he only managed to fall asleep at around 2 a.m. last night. His clock slash microwave hybrid read that it was currently 5.12 a.m. with the dark sky outside his window to prove it. It was way too early. Carefully slipping out from in between his friends and standing up, Peter sighed and rubbed his tired eyes before stepping out of his room and into the hall. His American-style department was pretty modest, all things considered. A kitchen, two bedrooms for him, and May with closets along with a decent living room. Well, it wasn't small by any means, but it wasn't big either, you know? It was the best they could get with what they had. But Peter wasn't one to complain about being lower middle class. It was theirs, and that was enough for him. May's paycheck along with Ben's life insurance were the things that actually let them pay the bills. 
with Peter's photography job being enough for things like groceries and stuff that wasn't necessary. Still, it wouldn't be too bad to have some extra cash, but whatever. Now, what to make for breakfast? His friends probably weren't going to wake for another hour or two, so he should be able to have something by then. Looking over the cabinets in the kitchen, Peter shrugged and grabbed a bag of sugar along with some baking powder, flour, and some more ingredients before setting them on the kitchen counter. Hopefully, they were fine with pancakes. He'd try his aunt's wheat cakes, but he wasn't too good at making them yet. He just hoped he didn't mess this breakfast up. Although, he should probably change into something more fit for the job first. Grabbing his web shooters that were conveniently laying on the kitchen table, Peter shot a web and pulled the apron that was laying on the kitchen island into his hands before putting it on. It was white in color and soft to the touch along with pictures of cute animals and hearts on it with the words, Sweetest Chef, written at the bottom in English. That apron was one of the last things that Ben ever gave May, probably one of her most treasured positions now that he thought about it. The day after she left for Tokyo, she called him and said that she left the apron there as a way for him to remember them both. Man, you wouldn't believe how much he cried that day. A quick glance at the clock on the wall let him know it hasn't been even five minutes since he woke up. And another glance at the clock caused him to sigh and rub his eyes. He was so tired. You know what? He'd just wait until later to start cooking. It'd be dumb if he got done too early and have the pancakes end up cold by the time everyone woke up. Normally he'd take a cold shower to wake himself up, but today he was just not feeling that level of motivation. As some coffee would have to do, it was the best next thing. Peter yawned, pouring water into the reservoir of the machine and adding a few tablespoons of coffee grounds onto the filter before he pressed a button and watched as the carafe filled up with dark liquid. From what he heard, the coffee ground he buys is made by some guy whose cork allows him to increase the caffeine in anything. Pretty specific for a quirk, but useful. The teen rubbed his eyes again as he started to walk towards the kitchen table, pulling back a chair and sitting down. He'd just sit and listen to the coffee brew while he waited, probably play on his phone a bit. A few seconds passed before he realized something. His phone was still in his room. All right, change of plans. He really didn't want to get up again, so he'd just sit there and wait for the coffee. In silence. God, he hated mornings. Man, he couldn't even turn on the TV or else risk waking everyone up. Maybe he should just go to sleep on the table. Just as his eyes began to close, the small vibration at the back of his skull jolted him up. Good morning, Kato greeted, somehow making her way from his room to the table without opening her eyes. As she sat down on the seat across from him, Peter couldn't help but chuckle softly at how she had her long hair wrapped around her neck like a scarf. Hey! Hato, how'd you sleep? He really wanted some conversation right now. She yawned into her hand before putting her elbows on the tables and smiling. Great. Who knew your floor would be comfortable? Guess the carpet helps out. Well, that and the pillow I grabbed. Peter raised an eyebrow at that. The what? I hugged a pillow while I was asleep. You know? Don't you do that sometimes? Uh, he was just gonna tell her. Hato, that was my arm. He corrected, a small bit of warmth making its way up to his face. The girl across from him froze at the statement. Peter was sure he could see the faintest bit of red on her cheeks. ID, huh? Man, maybe he shouldn't have told her. Made things a lot more awkward now that he thought about it. Nice going, Parker. Oh my gosh. I am so sorry. I didn't know and, and it was comfy and wait, that sounded weird. I just d dash Hato began stumbling over an apology as Peter sat there. Her face was growing redder and redder each time she tripped over her words. The girl waving her hands to try and salvage what she was trying to say. It was weird seeing her flustered. You know? Peter had never even thought about the fact that she could be anything other than happy and carefree outside from that one time in the battle trial. A soft smile grew on his face as the girl across from him went on and on. Peter having stopped listening a bit ago. She was being really cute. His face grew hotter as what he had thought dawned on him. Look, it's fine. It was kinda nice. Hato's eyes went wide as her face grew redder. The girl immediately freezing. A second passed before Peter realized what he just said. His mouth opened as if to try and backtrack before closing. Damn. He wasn't gonna even try to save this one. Why did he say that? He just made things really weird. 
God, he was the worst. The two stared at each other for what felt like hours, neither knowing what to say or do with Peter silently freaking out. What now? All he could do was try to not make the hole he just dug himself into any deeper. Just as he was about to try and say something, the coffee machine dinged, signaling it was done brewing. Oh, thank God. Laughing awkwardly, Peter shot up from his chair and pointed to the machine over his shoulder. Coffee? You want some? It's really good, he asked, trying his hardest to change the subject. Yes, sure. Yeah. Hato sighed in relief at the subject change, her cheeks slowly losing the red they once had. Man, he totally saved that. Good going, past Peter. The boy set two mugs filled with the freshly brewed coffee onto the table before going to a cabinet to look for some sugar packets along with creamer. He handed two of each to the girl across the table, her only nodding in thanks as they both poured them into their drinks. Now, Peter had to admit that it tasted even better than usual for whatever reason, but he wouldn't question. At this hour, he really needed a boost. The normally bitter taste was mixed with sweetness as it touched his tongue. Peter could only sigh in relief that it wasn't burning hot. Setting his mug down, Peter ran a hand through his hair as he sat in the awkward silence, with Hato setting her mug down at her side of the table. All right, he saved the situation before, but all there was left to do now was actually start up another conversation. Silence filled the home as Peter looked into his mug. Now, he just had to figure out what to talk about. This was the worst. Hato giggled softly, making him tilt his head and meet her eye. Nice apron, by the way. Peter looked down at himself and saw how he was still wearing May's apron. He must have forgotten to take it off. He chuckled rubbing his left forearm as a scar started to sting slightly. Thanks, it's my aunt's. The girl let out a confused noise, taking a quick sip from her mug. Wait, you live with your aunt? I thought she was your stepmom because you called her by her first name. Ah, that did kind of make sense now that he thought about it. Yeah, she's my aunt. Man, you wouldn't believe how happy she was when I told her I was having friends over, May started freaking out and telling him how proud she was of him finally starting to make some friends. Even though it was super embarrassing, he would be lying if he said that he wasn't happy that he made some friends too. She's in Tokyo, right? Hato asked, Peter nodded. So, you live by yourself all the time? He winced a bit at that, but nodded either way. Peter would be the first to admit that it has been incredibly lonely, with yesterday and today the first time the apartment has felt full in a while. It's nice to have other people there, you know? Even if it's only for a night. As Peter drank some coffee from his mug, Hato let out a soft hum. So, your uncle doesn't live with you? Or are he and your aunt divorced? At those words, Peter nearly choked on his drink, before putting the mug down the distant sound of a gunshot sounding off in front of a convenience store at night played in his head. Coughing, Peter cleared his throat and looked down at the table. Ben isn't with us anymore. He said softly, Hato's eyes widened at the revelation and a look of pure guilt appeared on her face. Oh, look, I am so sorry. I, I shouldn't have even said anything. She began apologizing profusely, leaning forward on the table. Maybe he should let her know he wasn't mad or anything. He was pretty sure she said something about getting insecure about asking sensitive things. Peter put on as soft a smile as he could manage and leaned forward on the table, getting Hato to stop apologizing for a moment. Hato, it's fine, all right? Sorry for bringing it up and making the mood awkward and stuff. He reassured, making the girl mutter out an apology one more time. It happened a little over a year ago, so I've been dealing with it. That was a lie. Peter was not dealing with it that well yet, but he was getting there. Suppose it was the fact he only actually started focusing on grieving about it this week. Actually coming to terms with Ben's death might take a few more years. Do you want to talk about it? I know it's hard losing someone close to you, she offered, taking a slow sip from her mug. When thinking about it, part of him wanted to actually talk to someone other than May about it, but another part didn't. Pretty sure he already ruined the mood enough as is, he didn't need to turn this morning into a vent session. It's fine, all right? Thanks for worrying, anyway. He smiled at her, taking one last sip from his mug and sighing at the sweet and bitter taste as the girl nodded hesitantly. The two teens sat in a sort of peaceful silence, 
with Peter taking the time to think about what just happened. It was a weird feeling having someone not directly related to you actually care about what's going on in your life and want to help. But that's what Hato has done for the past few months he's known her, along with Amajiki and Togata. A part of him wanted to let them know he appreciated them, you know? Peter's never been good with emotional type stuff, so he could just buy them something with his next paycheck the bugle gives him. Wait, he might need that paycheck for groceries. So that was a no-go. Maybe something that didn't cost him money he didn't have? Something sentimental. Hold up, Japanese people had a whole thing where they called people close to them by their first name, right? Hey, Hato. Peter started, already a plan in mind. He just hoped it didn't make things awkward. Hmm. She looked up from her mug and gave him a soft smile that made him feel warm for whatever reason. Since we're friends and all, can you call me Peter instead of Parker? That's something Japanese people do, right? What he didn't expect was for Hato to adopt a blush and raise her eyebrows up to her hairline. Crap. Did he mess it up? Please tell him he didn't mess it up. Why you sure? I see couldn't dash. The girl seemed incredibly flustered. Way more than he felt that she should be. Her face was growing redder and redder, with the blush contrasting her periwinkle hair that somehow shone. She looked great. Wait. Focus. Dude, we don't have to if you don't wanna. It's just that I really like having you as a friend and stuff and kinda wanted to show you I appreciate you, you know? Nodding, Hato let out a soft laugh as her face seemed to grow a bit redder while her blue eyes softened a bit. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. All right, Pa Peter. Huh, she dropped the honorifics too. Peter didn't even know that was supposed to happen. It was good though, he didn't like honorifics that much. You can call me Nijire then. She added, pushing a strand of her messy hair behind her left ear in a way that made his heartbeat a bit faster. All right, he'd need to figure out what that was all about later, because he was pretty sure it wasn't a normal thing. A sure thing. Peter chuckled, taking a look back at the clock to see it was 5.47, just as a few grumbles of someone waking up came from his room. Guess they got tired of cuddling. But seriously, who does that at a sleepover? Good for them anyway. Hey, you're good with eating pancakes, right? It's probably the best idea I got for breakfast right now. He asked, watching as the girl shot up from her chair. Pancakes? I'll help you. Hanijire exclaimed, already moving towards the ingredients he had laid out on the counter. Peter smiled softly as the girl got to work, before realizing he should probably be helping out too. Thanks, Nijire. Sitting at his desk, Peter couldn't help but feel a bit more relaxed now. Today had been going great so far. He got on a first-name basis with Nijire, had some incredible pancakes, hung out with his friends a bit before they had to make their way to school, and even found the yen equivalent to about 20 bucks. It just felt like he couldn't lose today, like he was finally catching a break free from his problems. At least for today. Even if it was a half day today cause Japan was weird like that. Seriously, who approved having school on Saturdays? Hanijire was bouncing up and down talking to Amajiki about something, while Peter was having a conversation with Togata, talking to him about a very important subject. Are you sure you guys aren't a thing? Togata's cheeks grew a bit redder, with the boy waving his hands in defense. No, me and Tamaki aren't like that. Dude, you were cuddling at a sleepover, with two other people sleeping next to you. You know, Peter didn't even know why he cared. Guess it was either out of pure boredom or frustration of neither of the two actually making a move. Maybe a little bit of both. I moved in my sleep. We aren't like that. The brunette was about to say something before an idea hit him. An explanation. Are you scared to tell him? He asked, unconsciously tracing the scars on his forearm. The blonde was about to protest before pausing and hanging his head in defeat. Absolutely terrified. Ah, there we go. All Peter could do was give him a sympathetic pat on the shoulder before changing the subject. Maybe he'd help him out if they took too long to get together. Yeah, that might be entertaining. Peter pulled out his phone, seeing how they still had about a minute before class. Scrolling down a news app he used to use to find crimes, he could see that All Might had caught that sludge villain that held that middle schooler hostage earlier in the morning. At the end of the article, Peter's eyes widened at the name of the hostage the villain had taken that day. A head of spiky ash-blonde hair, 
angry crimson eyes along with what seemed like a permanent scowl that portrayed nothing but annoyance and hatred. Katsuki Bakugo. It was that second year with the explosion quirk back at Aldera. The one that went around school like he owned it and was a total jerk all the time. Man, either way, Peter couldn't help but feel a bit sorry for him. Even if he was a horrible person and just sucked to be around, no one deserved to be held hostage by a villain like that. Not even him. Quickly, Peter turned off his cracked phone and placed it back into his pocket, just as the back of his head tingled slightly to signal the giant door opening. Morning, Aizawa greeted, hands in his pockets as he walked up to the podium. I have a few announcements to make. Oh, that wasn't ominous at all. 20 bucks that he makes some merchandise and starts giving out autographs. First off, good job at the USJ yesterday. It was by design that you got thrown into the exercise without actually being told how to conduct rescues to see how you guys did, not bad. Peter had to resist the urge of calling Aizawa a proud mom right then and there. He'll probably do it when he gets him that world's best mom mug. Crap, he's gonna need to save up for that joke. It'll be worth it. Second, we'll be having another field trip next week. Aizawa started. The brunette only raised an eyebrow and leaned forward in his seat. Nizu wants to try and have more educational heroics classes, so he's set up for the hero course to go to the Mizutafu Museum of International Heroics. Class B will go on Tuesday and will go on Wednesday. You know what? That sounded kind of cool. Peter hadn't been too much of a museum guy, but he's heard that the Mizutafu Museum of International Heroics was probably one of the best museums in the world. Now, he wasn't too knowledgeable on what exactly was there, but he's heard they even had some exhibits on some X-Men things. Might be cool to see stuff about American heroes. Wait, maybe he could take some pictures there to sell to the Bugle. And lastly, the UA Sports Festival is coming up in two weeks. Their teacher announced, with everyone but Peter voicing their excitement. Even Amajiki seemed pumped. Thing was, Peter wasn't entirely too sure about what the sports festival even was. Given how he had been pretty preoccupied for the last year, spider powers and all, he hasn't had a chance to actually tune into the event. From what he understood, it was some sort of massive event that UA hosted every year and broadcasted to the entire country for students to show off. Given how this is on par with the Olympics back in the 21st century, there will be a lot of eyes on it. It will be the prime opportunity for you four to show off your abilities and get noticed by agencies for internships and work studies. Not only that, but as there are currently 16 open spots in this class, general education students will be aiming to show that they belong in this course. Noticed by agencies. Peter was pretty confident on the idea of not being affiliated with an agency when he actually gets a license since that just wasn't his style, but he guessed it'd be good experience right now. I mean, Mirko made it to Japan's top 10 without an agency or sidekicks. Why couldn't he? Wait, could he get an internship with Mirko? That'd be sick. Too bad she didn't take sidekicks. Now, I kept you four in this class because I can see potential, and I expect for you to show everyone that same potential and do your best, plus ultra. Aizawa said, running a hand through his hair before pulling out his yellow sleeping bag from somewhere and went to sleep right then and there. Ha, huh, that was probably his version of a pep talk. It wasn't even that bad of a speech. Nijire went back to talking to Amajiki about whatever as Peter rolled his shoulder. He wasn't the competitive type, but he wanted to do good at that festival. Not too sure about trying to win the whole thing, but he was going to try his best. To show the world that he deserved to be where he was now to show himself, to show May and Ben. He'd be spectacular out there. Just for them, do we really have to be in costume for this? Peter asked, checking to see his web shooters were loaded for some reason. Not like he was gonna use them anyway. I don't get why you're complaining. I love wearing my costume. Nijire looked as if she was about to use her quirk to do a spin before stopping herself and remembering where they were. It just feels weird going to a museum wearing a vest made out of Kevlar and carbon nanofibers. Tugging at his vest, Peter checked to see it was zipped up all the way and that the extra cartridges were still in the small pockets. Good thing he finally got around to making more cartridges on Monday. Be quiet so I can focus on the road. Aizawa grumbled from his place at the steering wheel, face showing annoyance. I don't need us getting into an accident. Peter chuckled as he rested his head on the back support, closing his eyes before realizing something. Hey, 
Why does Amajiki get to be in front? His teacher glared at him through the rearview mirror. Because he's tolerable. Eh, that's fair. Today was Wednesday, his second week at UA, and the day that his class would be going on their field trip to the Musutifu Museum of International Heroics, with their sister class of 1B having gone the day before. But still, who knew that a field trip would end up with them sitting in Aizawa's car as they drove there? Not gonna lie, he half expected it to be the type of minivan soccer moms use. It was less hobo looking than he thought, though. It even looked presentable. Thing is, since 1B has a full class of 20 students, they got to ride the type of bus they took to the USJ. But given how their class only has four students because, and he wasn't pointing any fingers here, someone decided to expel everybody else on the first day, they ended up going the simpler route of Aizawa's personal car. It was a simple black sedan, with comfortable seats along with smelling oddly like coffee and cats. It could have been worse. From what Aizawa told them, Nizu decided to make them go in his car due to not wanting to waste money on a bus for such a small class and how driving there together would be a bonding experience, which was incredibly stupid because of so many reasons. First, it's not like they were renting the buses. They literally built them from scratch and then made robots to drive them. And second, why did Nizu even care about money? UA was probably the richest school in the country, had enough cash to build multiple fake cities and stadiums along with receiving funding from companies like Stark Industries. He probably had other motives now that he thought about it. God, that rat scared him. Besides, the ride has mostly been spent talking to his classmates and occasionally annoying Aizawa in ways that wouldn't make him crash the car. Hey, hey, Peter. You said your aunt came back from Tokyo the other day, right? You must be excited. Hato began a conversation causing Aizawa to grumble in the front. Smiling, Peter leaned forwards in his seat while Amajiki and Togata looked at him, waiting for him to talk. Yeah, she came back on Monday. It's been super nice having someone in the house, even if it'll only be for a week. It still amazed him how she actually managed to get her job to give her a week-long vacation, you know? The day his aunt came back was mostly hugging each other due to her time apart, that along with her helping him out with all the stuff he's had going on. That is, helping him with actively grieving both Ben and Mizuku. Either way, it didn't stop her from interrogating him about how it was having a girl over for the night even if his other friends were there. God, she was on the verge of giving him the talk right then and there. Oh, I bet she's super nice. From the way you talk about her, she must be the best. Togata said, giving him a firm pat on the back while smiling big. Around him, Amajiki and Nijire voiced their agreements on what Togata said. The indigo-haired boy's face even showed a small smile. Yeah, she's great. The smile behind his mask was one of pure affection, with Togata about to say something again before being stopped when Aizawa let off a growl. Man, that guy was no fun. As the world passed by the window Peter sat by, with Heido at the other bouncing up and down and she talked to Togata who was in the middle, he tightened his hold on his new backpack that sat on his lap. Instead of only having one strap, the new one had two along with a few pouches but still kept the original design of being black with a small version of his spider symbol. It had more storage space now, allowing him to have things such as snacks and even a respirator in case of things like gases. Cause the cloth of his mask wasn't gonna help him out in that department no matter how much he would like it to. But seriously, it would have been awesome. The boy closed his eyes for a moment, making his lenses mimic the expression and rested his head on the back support of his seat. Maybe he could take a little nap until they got there. Yeah, that'd be nice. Wake up, we're here. The voice of Togata came in a whisper, followed by the feeling of Peter being shaken. Groaning, Peter opened his eyes and sat forward in his seat, pulling his goggles up to rub the tiredness out of his eyes before pulling them back down. Man, his neck was killing him right now. He muttered a thank you to Togata for waking him up and followed both him and Hato out of the car. Whoa, was all he could see when looking at what was before them. The Mizutifu Museum of International Heroics. It might have been one of the biggest buildings he's ever seen, way bigger than any museum he's ever been to in New York anyway. He could only guess it had at least three floors from looking at it from the outside. A few giant banners hung down from the top to around the middle of the structure, advertising all sorts of different exhibits and events. All right, let's go, Aizawa ordered. 
gesturing for his students to follow him as he began his way from the parking lot to the stairs that led to the museum. I, it's way bigger than I thought, Amajiki mumbled, pulling his hood over his head as a few people pointed out that they were heroes. Well, heroes in training, but that didn't matter. Heroes sounded way cooler anyway. Oh, I bet there's all kinds of interesting stuff in there. Hey, hey, Peter, what do you think we'll see? She shook his shoulder a bit to get his attention, making the boy look up from his camera. Something that my boss will buy pics of Z at least, he muttered, placing the camera strap around his neck and looking at the girl. Well, I did hear they have a piece of that mineral from Wakanda called vibranium. It was still kind of crazy to think he'd be so close to what was probably the most valuable material on the planet. But seriously, a metal only found in Wakanda that was stronger than steel but a third of the weight, and capable of absorbing vibrations and negating damage at a molecular level? No wonder that Wakanda was one of the richest and most advanced countries in the world. Only guys like Tony Stark or whole governments could afford it. Man, too bad he can't afford any vibranium on a freelance photographer's salary. Maybe one day. Uh, who was he kidding? He won't be getting any vibranium suits anytime soon. But hey, a spider could dream. The class walked through the main entrance of the museum, with Aizawa flashing his hero license at a young-looking guy wearing a museum uniform working at the front desk. The worker waves them in, putting a band on their wrists that says that they are on a school trip before wishing them a good experience. Man, this place is huge. Togata breathed out a laugh, the class simply taking in the sight of the museums inside. It was one giant hallway with different statues, exhibits, artifacts, and props standing in cases along with random walls and pillars scattered about with even more stuff on display. Looking up, Peter could see the higher levels were only walkways that wrapped around the inside of the structure, with even more exhibits. When looking farther into the structure, he noticed how nearly everyone was towards the front of the building with the back being basically deserted. His spider sense buzzed in the back of his head lightly, making him turn his head and see a young woman walking up to them. She wore dark suit pants, a white collared shirt rolled up to the elbow along with a gray waistcoat and a blue tie, with glasses to top off the outfit. Her hair was purple and styled into a proper ponytail, a small polite smile on her face. Looking closer, Peter could see that she wore a badge that said, Tour Guide. Hello, you must be from UA, correct? She asked, hands behind his back as Aizawa nodded tiredly. Oh, wonderful. You're right on time. Although, you do seem to be quite small compared to the class that came in yesterday. Oh, he wonders why that is. Seeing the camera hanging around his neck, Peter raised his hand to get the woman's attention. Uh, ma'am, is it fine if I take pictures? He asked, pointing at his camera while making Aizawa raise an eyebrow at him. Oh, of course. We love when young kids are interested in recording our tours. Go right ahead. On that note, let's get going. Sweet. Their tour guide began to walk, with their class following behind as Peter fiddled with his camera settings. Why do you even want to take pictures? I doubt it's for remembering an educational experience. Aizawa mumbled, keeping his voice low enough for the lady not to hear them. Didn't you have a job in high school? I need money sometimes, we can't all live a hobo lifestyle. Maybe the remark at the end wasn't necessary. But the annoyed grunt Aizawa let off was oh so worth it. Didn't you have a job in high school? I need money sometimes, we can't all live a hobo lifestyle. Maybe the remark at the end wasn't necessary. But the annoyed grunt Aizawa let off was oh so worth it. The class followed their guide before she stopped around the middle of the museum. She stood in front of a wooden stand that was holding up a clear glass casing. Inside was a silver sword. It shone in the light, making the markings and engravings on it pop out even more and contrasting its black hilt. Under the sword was what Peter assumed to be an old-school samurai helmet that was made out of that same shiny silver metal along with having red accents. A few scratches could be noticed. Curiously enough, they always came in sets of three that were closely packed together. And this, the woman presented the case with a wave of her hand. Is both the sword and the helmet from one of the X-Men's most notorious villains? The Silver Samurai. Wait, that stuff was from an X-Men villain? Sick. Wait, don't the X-Men normally operate in the US? 
Why do you guys have some of their villain stuff here? Togata asked, cupping his chin. Well, I suppose that calling him more of a Wolverine villain would be more accurate. She pointed to a few pictures inside of the glass case, depicting what looked to be a fight between one of the X-Men's members, Wolverine, against a man in shiny silver samurai armor. That silver must be sort of the branding. But still, Peter had always heard stories about how Wolverine had been one of the first cases of a quirk manifesting in someone all the way back in the late 1800s. Back then, less than 1% of the world had a quirk, with the quirk factor being called the X gene instead, and people with quirks being called mutants. That was about all of what Peter knew, though. Most of the guy's backstory was completely unknown by everyone except those who actually knew him with the public only knowing that his quirk was some sort of regeneration that has let him live until today along with having claws and better senses. Still, how did he end up with his claws being adamantium? Last time he checked, it wasn't a material that could organically appear in someone's body. But who knows? Maybe he went through some sort of secret experiment to get them coded in the stuff. Along with being one of the oldest people on Earth, Wolverine has been known to operate in Japan on occasion. Thus, leading him to fight Kanuchio Harada, better known as the Silver Samurai before locking him up in Tartarus. Huh, the guy must have been crazy dangerous if they had to lock him up in Tartarus. It was probably the most secure prison in the world along with the raft back in America. Part of him always wondered if they would have thrown him in there if he had said no to going to UA. Scary stuff to think about. That's so cool. Wait, can you tell us about the guy's quirk? I bet it's super interesting. Nijire was bouncing up and down beside him, excitement clear in her face. Oh, of course. The class from yesterday wasn't as eager to learn as you guys. Pressing a button on the wooden black that held up the case, a video started to play on the glass. It was a cartoon version of the sword, animated to try and cut through a brick wall but failing. Then, a weird purple aura began to glow around it, with it again trying to cut through the wall and slashing it in half. His quirk, Tachyon Field, allows him to create fields that are composed of what are known as tachyon particles, which are particles that travel faster than light. Using this field on his blade, for example, would allow it to cut through almost anything. Yikes, that was super cool. And super scary, good thing that guy was locked up right now. Oh, that's so cool. Too bad someone with such a strong quirk ended up a villain and stuff, though. Wait, is there anything that I can't cut through? The girl continued bouncing until she subconsciously started to slowly lift herself off the ground before Peter grabbed her shoulders and put her back down, with her muttering a small apology before going back to bouncing. Why was it that he was the one that had to ground her every time she did that? Well, I sure am glad you're excited. The woman laughed lightly, seeming amused by them. But lucky for you, we have a material right here that could withstand it. Please follow me T-Dash, as she began to shepherd them towards another glass casing with some sort of metal inside it. Peter groaned as his spider sense rang in his ears. Well, screamed would be the better word for it. It began yelling at him about some sort of unseen danger while pointing him in all directions like a broken compass. He grabbed his head to try and alleviate the discomfort. Wait, danger? Parker, you alright? Aizawa asked. Peter opened his eyes as much as the ringing in his head would allow to and saw how everyone near him looked on at him with concern, even random people passing by. He had to warn them, for his spider sense to be screaming at him like it was now, they had to get everyone out of there. Aizawa, something's gonna happen, and and I don't know what it is but you have T-Dash, a series of ear-splitting explosions burst from the windows near the third floor and cut him off, ringing throughout the museum and sending debris raining down. In flew a series of people wearing white masks devoid of any facial features, roughly landing on the ground and starting to grab whatever was in sight. Everybody get on the freaking ground! One of them shot out some sort of energy blast from his hands, causing even more debris to fall that thankfully missed anyone but caused a panic. Crap. Aizawa seemed conflicted for a second, looking between the panicking civilians and his students. With a small sigh and a look of purpose, the man brought his goggles over his eyes. You four are now authorized to use your quirks to protect yourself and others. Your main objective is to evacuate civilians. Only engage if you have to. Let's go. He ordered before starting to guide people outside. Of course, there had to be a heist today. Because why not? 
Peter nodded instantly, throwing his camera in his backpack before picking up the tour guide bridal style and rushing towards the entrance. Although a bit hesitantly, his other classmates nodded and began getting people out as soon as possible, with Aizawa doing the same. Now, Peter knew better than anyone that he wasn't too knowledgeable on proper procedure when it came to being a hero and doing hero stuff. Even so, there was one thing he had known from the start. Civilians come first. You get them out of there before you do anything else. No matter what, you put everything else on hold to save them. Civilians always come first. Going as fast as his legs would carry him while people screamed around him, Peter let their tour back onto her feet when they reached the entrance, Peter leaving her outside. You okay? Sorry if I ran a bit fast there, but, you know. Peter gave a vague wave of his hand, letting the woman get her panicked breathing under control. Why yes, thank you so much. God, this has never happened in the museum's history. May I please get your name? I can't repay you enough for getting me out of there. Peter was about to say something before pausing, thinking over the words before giving her a reassuring smile under the mask. I'm just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. With that, Peter shot a web that stuck to the museum's high ceiling and swung back into action. He knew there were a lot of people in danger. Man, he was probably in a lot more danger than the people he was supposed to be rescuing, now that he thought about it. Even so, that dumb happy feeling in his chest wouldn't go away. That woman heard him say who he was, and she smiled. She didn't call him a menace or a criminal or anything like that. God, you wouldn't believe how much that meant to him. But that didn't matter now, he had things to do and people to help. Landing on one of the random pillars that were scattered about, Peter finally took a moment to scan over what was happening. Looking at the people doing the heist, he could see none of them had guns visible, meaning that they most likely didn't have long-range options outside of quirks. From what he counted, there had to be about 15 or so. At around where they were when the attack started, Aizawa and Nijire were escorting people outside while Amajiki and Togata helped those caught in the initial debris that fell. Wait, a heist meant that they were trying to steal something, right? As his lenses narrowed on the villains, he could see them trying to haul as many exhibits and artifacts as they could, running toward a line that connected to the hole they came in. Well, he can't have that. Peter began to shoot webs at the hole on the wall that they came from, sealing it off with a thick layer of silk and hopping down to the ground before they noticed who did it. While it would be cool to get into a fight with a villain, that wasn't in his best interest. Just as he landed in a crouch, Peter ran towards Togata and Amajiki and began throwing rubble off of the few people that got caught, quickly freeing the leg of a boy with messy purple hair and eye bags. Ah, he kinda looked like Aizawa, didn't he? Hey, you alright? Anything broken? He asked, kneeling down to his level as the boy held his ankle. And here I thought museums were boring. Am I right? The boy stared at him for a moment with an incredulous look. Guess not too many people had a sense of humor. Uh, bad timing, that's my bad. Can you walk? His ankle looked bruised, but Peter could tell it wasn't broken. Cause when he broke his ankle it looked way worse than that. Why yeah, I think it's just a sprain. Sprained? Yeah, this guy wasn't gonna walk for a bit. Oh, he would kill for recovery girl's quirk right about now. All right, man, we should get you out of here. All right? Amajiki. Peter called out to the hooded boy, making him place an elderly looking man at the entrance and turned to him. Can you help this guy out? I want to help more with the rubble and you'd be gentler when moving him. Oh, he would kill for recovery girl's quirk right about now. All right, man, we should get you out of here. All right? Amajiki. Peter called out to the hooded boy, making him place an elderly looking man at the entrance and turned to him. Can you help this guy out? I want to help more with the rubble and you'd be gentler when moving him. The sound of a fight at the other side of the museum reached his ears. He could distinctly hear what sounded like Najira's quirk and Aizawa fighting someone but he ignored it. Fighting wasn't what mattered. Besides, they probably had it under control. Nodding. Amajiki wrapped a tentacle around the boy's waist and began to take him to the entrance with Togata in tow. All right, that was the last civilian around him. Wait, where were Aizawa and Najira? His spider sense buzzed, giving just enough time to flip out of the way of a villain crashing onto where he just was. He webbed the seemingly unconscious woman to the ground, 
taking a breath and turning to see where she came from. Aizawa stood there with Najira hovering beside him. Around them were a series of unconscious villains surrounded by dropped museum artifacts. When did that even happen? Uh, you guys good? We got everyone out on this side. He swung through the air and landed in a crouch next to them. Najira did look tired, probably for the extensive use of her quirk when getting people out and helping out Aizawa when fighting, but she seemed fine. Same here, more heroes should already be on the way to take these guys away. Let's wait outside for now, Aizawa said, motioning his head toward the entrance. Aizawa checked the two teens for any injuries, but they seemed fine outside from a few bruises that Najira had gotten when helping Aizawa fight. Quickly, the three of them started their journey towards the entrance at a brisk pace, about to step outside until Peter realized something. None of them went to the back of the museum, right? His mind wandered back to when he looked around the museum when they first got there. There still might be people there. As they stepped foot into the outside, Peter looked back onto the villains that Aizawa and Najira had fought and started to count. There were only 14. Crap. There's still people in there. Not wasting a second, Peter shot a web behind him and swung back into the now-trashed museum, taking time to web the knocked-out villains to the ground. Behind him, Aizawa cursed out loud and called out Peter to come back, with the boy not hearing him given how the doors were slammed closed in front of him. Landing in a column, his lenses narrowed at seeing the last villain holding a girl that looked to be in her early twenties with his fist pointed to her head. Looking closer he could see some sort of gauntlet was on his arm. It was a hostage situation. Crap again. This was getting way too messy. Hey, can't interest you in letting her go, right? Peter joked, trying not to show his increasing nervousness. The man removed his mask, throwing it on the ground to reveal the yellow and brown balaclava he wore underneath. Wait, why was he wearing two masks? Step back. Bug, you don't want to see her getting hurt. Now do you? The man spoke in broken Japanese, even saying some words in English with a heavy southern accent. No, I can't say I do. How about we skip the monologuing and wait is that all might? Peter looked behind the man, making both him and the girl gasp and turn around. Oh, he forgot how dumb some criminals were. He shot a web toward the arm pointed at her head yanking the man to the ground before flipping off the pillar and landing on top of him and knocking the weird locking gauntlet away. You all right? The boy turned to the girl, ignoring the sounds of struggle from the man under him. Now that he thought about it, he might have been a bit too rough. And you can't blame him. Why you're that spider guy that got arrested? I thought you were a menace. Man, what? I just saved you, man. How see, you know what? Whatever. You all right? With a look of caution, the girl nodded slowly while looking at him as if he'd attack her. All right, there's heroes outside and everyone here is knocked out, so you'll be good. And you're welcome by the way. The girl nodded before starting to run to the entrance. Okay, all the civilians were out of the museum and all the villains were incapacitated, which meant he should be able to leave. But even so, there was still something clawing at the back of his mind heists aren't like robbing a store or trashing a city. They're organized set up by someone smart that can get people to follow a plan. Now, organized crime was in no way common nowadays, with America being the main country that still has it, but a thing that Peter has learned about fighting it was that the guys who actually did the work weren't too bad to crack. Might have to copy Knuckle Duster real quick and do a bit of interrogation, huh? Stuff like intimidation wasn't his thing, but he would need to figure out who orchestrated this. Then tell Aizawa or the police. Quickly, Peter got off from the guy and grabbed him, throwing him at a wall and webbing him to it by his hands. Man, this felt mean. No offense, but you don't seem to be too much of a master planner. So I'll take a wild guess and say that someone else planned this? The masked teen walked up to the man, narrowing his lenses in his face. Seeing as he was speaking in English, the man laughed and narrowed his eyes right back. I ain't telling nothing to some prepubescent brat. Prepubescent? He was fifteen. Either way, it was clear that while the guy was not that smart, he still wasn't going to talk. What was that thing Knuckle Duster said about interrogating someone? Threatening them? God, he felt more like Batman than Spider-Man. Dude, I feel like it'd be better if you just told me, so you can just go about having a dumb accent without getting too hurt. Peter tried to sound intimidating, but it seemed like it wasn't working that well. 
All right, plan B. Oh, he was gonna feel super bad about this later. Peter sighed and placed his five fingers on the guy's mask, sticking to it before ripping off the fabric with a strong pull. The now unmasked man screamed, seeming to get a lot more nervous. Christ, the hell is wrong with you, boy? He yelled, struggling against the webs that stuck his arms to the wall. Letting the piece of the mask he ripped off fall from his fingertips to the ground, Peter narrowed his lenses before placing his fingertips on the man's face. That doesn't only work with cloth, you know? Oh, please let the guy not call his bluff. He began to sweat as Peter slowly started to pull away, inch by inch before letting out a panicked cry and a curse. All right, I'll talk. I'll talk. Jesus, how the hell are ya, a hero? He screamed, Peter inwardly sighing and letting go of his face. Oh, thank God it worked. All right, who planned this? Who's your boss? Peter's hand inched up toward the man's face, making him panic even more. I, I don't know. None of us know what he looks like. Heard he's some guy from New York that likes running a criminal empire or something. Criminal empire? Something told him this wasn't a crime family situation given how he didn't know what his boss looked like. He's got a name, doesn't he? His hand inches up a tiny bit more, making the criminal squirm. No one knows, either. He goes by an alias. His lenses narrowed as he inched his hand even closer, making the man hurry up. He calls himself the big man. That's all I know. The big man. Huh? All right, thanks. Satisfied, Peter took a step back and webbed up the guy's mouth. He'd have to tell Aizawa about this. Big man of crime. Underground work probably faces way more organized crime than daylight heroes. You know? I didn't expect you to talk that easily. In all honesty, I'm shocked. Peter laughed lightly, reloading his web shooters without taking his eyes off of him. Okay, everyone was accounted for, criminals and villains alike, and he even figured out who was behind all of this. All in all, not bad. He was a bit scared he'd be rusty on all of this. Well, all there's left to do was go outside a freeze. His spider sense screamed in his ears, giving him enough time to rip the criminal off of the wall and grab him before jumping away from a torrent of fire that would have no doubt hit them both. His lenses widened in surprise at seeing the blue-clad man now standing in the museum, flames coming off of parts of his body. The number two hero, Endeavor. Great. He could just turn this guy in. Oh, hey man. Look, I got him for US dash. Not. Another. Word. The man growled, flames burning brighter. Now come quietly, Villa. What did he call him? Uh, you're talking to him, right? Peter chuckled nervously, pointing at the man he was holding. Well, I already got him. Endeavor's blue eyes narrowed at the boy, a scowl growing on his face. I know who you are, Spider-Man. A menace, a vigilante and villain. That is no doubt working with these low lives to steal from the museum. Huh? Villain? Criminal? He was the good guy here, dropping the man and webbing him to the floor. Peter raised his hands in defense, unintentionally making the hero's flames grow brighter. What? I'm a UA student. I got caught on a field trip when these guys came in. I'm not working with them. He defended, a pleading expression behind his mask. The hero laughed, aiming his hands at the boy. A likely story. UA would never accept criminals like you. Now, stop resisting and you shall not be harmed much. No way. This wasn't happening. Resisting? I'm trying to tell you what's really going on. Why you can't seriously believe I'm working with them. Please, please believe him. Very well then. Flames began to burn in the man's arms. Peter already feeling a bit of the heat. You do not want to cooperate? So be it. I shall make you... Oh no. Why was he just standing there? He had to tell him he got it all wrong. God, stop standing there. Say something. Oh, damn me. Another torrent of fire was shot in his direction. Peter quickly ripping the webbed up criminal from the ground and diving behind a pillar for cover. Even though he was behind the stone column, the heat was becoming unbearable. Fire took up oxygen and used it as fuel, but he should be fine given how the windows were blown up, giving him air to breathe. Either way, Breathing wouldn't be easy if he got burnt or started to dehydrate. This was not happening. 
Oh, and now you're protecting a criminal from me? More proof as to why I must arrest you, boy. Wait, he knew he was a kid? And he was still doing this? Oh, this was just so messed up. Endeavor. Japan's number two ranked hero for the past 20-something years. And the top ranked hero when it came to both civilian and villain casualties in cases he's involved in. And he was currently trying to fight Peter. Oh man. He was gonna be a statistic. Now, Peter's opinion on Endeavor was pretty split. As a person, the guy sucked, he was a walking PR disaster that seemed to want to be a hero just to surpass All Might instead of actually helping people. As a hero, though, that part was a bit more complicated. Even if Peter didn't like his personality that much, he couldn't ignore the fact that he got results 90% of the time even if he didn't act heroic, catching villains and saving people from things like attacks and disasters. That is when he isn't burning villains alive or getting random civilians caught in accidental collateral damage along with causing property destruction that caused millions to repair. And that same guy was trying to fight Peter. This wasn't even Parker luck at this point, you know? There had to be some dark magic at work for him to be getting into this whole debacle. Man, the dehydration was probably starting to kick in, he just used the word debacle. Crap. Alright. Relax. Flames kept coming in waves. The pillar he had his back to starting getting hotter as it diverted the fire as if it was some rock in a lake. Hold up, that was a really good analogy. Wait. Focus. Oh, he was so screwed. Reaching into his belt while dropping the man he was holding to the ground, Peter started to search through his pouches for something that could help him. Some sort of identification or something. All it was all just web cartridges, gadgets, and first aid supplies. Crap. Switching to his backpack, he frantically dug through the bag as his panic began to increase. Peter was smart, people told him that all the time and he was decently confident in his brain. And it told him that there was no reality out there in which he wins against Endeavor in a straight-up fight. He's seen reports of him accidentally burning people to a crisp, along with the type of damage that those flames could do to structures. Structures like the pillar he was behind. He was so screwed, finding nothing useful in his bag. The boy threw it back over his shoulder and took a deep breath to try and calm down, ignoring Endeavor's enraged yells telling him to turn himself in or how his sweat was starting to make his mask stick to his face. He just, he just needs to think. Maybe even talk things out. Worth a shot. Wait. Stop for a sec. Peter called from behind his cover, hearing how the flames stopped hitting the pillar but still crackled at Endeavor's hands. Can we please talk this out? What is there to talk about, Spider-Man? I always knew you'd come back even after disappearing for months. Criminals like you always do. Okay, that was just hurtful. I am telling you I'm not a vigilante anymore, man. I am here on a UA field trip. Why won't you just listen to me? Suddenly, fire started to crash into the column again, making Peter's spider sense ring. I do not need to listen to you. I am a hero. Apprehending villains like you is what I do. Was it just him or was he hamming it up? Given how the fire wasn't stopping, he guessed talking it out was out of the question. The sounds of stone slowly cracking reached his ears. He was running out of time fast. What does he even do? Fighting was out of the picture, that would most likely be a death sentence or a near-death experience at best. And even if he won, then what? Just walk outside after beating him? If anything, the guy would probably make his life horrible and blacklist him from any hero school. Wait, what if he called for help? Not his friends or May, they wouldn't be able to help. Aizawa. Fishing his phone out of a pouch on his belt, Peter found Aizawa's name on speed dial and called. Oh, please pick up. Not even waiting for the first ring, Aizawa immediately picked up the phone, making Peter thank whatever deity there was above. Parker, where the hell are you? You ran back in there without my permission. You better have a damn explanation as to why you're not out here and why I shouldn't expel you. The man barked over on his end of the call, sounding absolutely furious. All right, Peter would have to worry about all of that later. Aizawa, dude. I'm sorry for just going in here, but there was this guy that we missed holding a girl hostage. But I got her. Stone kept cracking behind him. Peter's breathing beginning to become more and more frantic. What the hell is that sound? Are there still villains? Endeavor should be in there. Now why aren't you out yet? A part of Peter told him Aizawa's response wasn't gonna be pretty. 
Uh, it kinda is endeavor. All the villains are knocked out. Peter was met with silence on the other line. The only sound being fire being shot at him and endeavor cursing him out. Excuse me? He showed up after I got the last guy. Recognized I'm Spider-Man. Started to attack me after assuming I was working with the guys doing the best. And now I'm hiding behind a pillar trying not to get burned to death. What? Tell him you're a UA student caught in the attack. Aizawa ordered from his end. Peter could faintly hear his friends asking him what was going on. I did. He called me a liar and kept trying to attack me. Man, please tell me you got a plan because I'm freaking out over here and really don't want to die. There was a pause. Aizawa cursing out loud before he finally responded. If he is still unjustly attacking you, shit, just stay put and keep trying to convince him. There are 15 of his sidekicks guarding all entries into the building, but I'll try to go in there. Stay put? That was the plan? He was so gonna die today. Even if he does die, what a lame way to go out. Unjustly killed by the number two hero? Some random kid that had the consequences of his past catch up to him? Hey, if I die here, can you please take care of my aunt for me? Also, Aizawa just tells her I love her and thanks for giving me a second shot at the hero gig and for just being there. Peter said quietly into the phone, not waiting for a response before hanging up. Backed into a corner, Peter had run out of any safe option. He had to fight Endeavor. Even if he really does bite it in here, he gets to see Ben again. Now, was he scared right now? Of the high possibility of the number two hero killing him. Absolutely, Peter was freaking terrified. This wasn't a thing where he'd go down fighting to save a city or even one person. This was just for him. The only incentive Peter had for winning was his own life, not even the motivation of trying to protect a civilian. But was he still gonna go ahead with it? Give it his all? Yeah. He was. Taking a deep breath, Peter's lenses narrowed on the weird gauntlet that he had taken off the criminal before he shot a web that connected to it and pulled it into his hand. He looked down, sending an apologetic look to the webbed-up man at his feet that had been freaking out the entire time, with Peter not hearing him given how his mouth was webbed up and all. I'll need to borrow this for a sec. Hope you have spares, Peter said, watching the guy think about what he said and nod. Uh, now that he thought about it, this guy was probably rooting for him. Also, I know you're a bad guy and all, but I'll keep you safe from number two over there. He tried to reassure the man, watching him send a thankful look his way. Even though this guy did take part in the heist that got Peter in the situation, he'd do his best to keep him safe from whatever was going to happen. After all, even criminals need protecting sometimes, you know? All right, let's get the show on the road. Even though this guy did take part in the heist that got Peter in the situation, he'd do his best to keep him safe from whatever was going to happen. After all, even criminals need protecting sometimes, you know? All right, let's get the show on the road. Gripping the gauntlet in his hand tightly, Peter aimed towards the ceiling before throwing the metal device from behind cover, making Endeavor start blasting it with fire instead of the pillar. Made ya look! Peter flipped from behind cover, shooting two webs that covered the hero's eyes and making him curse. The boy landed in a crouch, running toward the man and punching him in the face, accidentally touching his flaming beard. All right, that wasn't part of the plan, but it did knock the guy down. But seriously, punching someone with a fire beard in the face really stung. Endeavor grabbed the webbing and ripped it off of his eyes, burning it in his hand and shooting another beam of fire at Peter. Your status has been more than confirmed. Boy, attacking a hero is enough reason alone for me to take you down. Peter flipped behind a random wall that was holding up a painting, letting out a scoff. What? You attacked me. You know, for all this power you have you sure aren't too responsible. His lenses landed on that samurai helmet from earlier laying next to him on the ground. The boy attaching a web line to it, gripping it right. Might as well use some of the things lying around. Besides, he could probably just blame the damage on Endeavor. The masked teen jumped out from behind the wall, swung the helmet by the webline stuck to it like makeshift mace before running at the red-haired man. Spider-sense ringing, Peter had barely enough time to dodge a volley of small fireballs that were shot at him, with a few gracing his body, which hurt and burned. It was just not pleasant. With a jump, 
Peter leaped up above the hero and swung the makeshift mace down at him. Endeavor somehow saw the attack coming and used jets of fire at his feet to dodge, swinging up a kick that hit Peter in the gut while he was in the air and couldn't dodge, sending him up into the air before blasting him with a torrent of fire. His entire body was surrounded by the biggest amount of heat he has ever felt. Peter screamed in pain as the skin exposed by his torn costume burned. It felt like someone had picked him up and dropped him into the sun, punched him in the face then dropped him into a whole other sun. All in all, he was in just so much pain. Maybe this is where he bites it, huh? Falling back down, Peter gained his bearings and did his best to use the adrenaline flowing through his veins to ignore the burning and aching in his skin, twisting in midair to avoid Endeavor punching him again. Using the floor as a springboard, Peter backflipped back behind a stone pillar to try and catch his breath. He barely had it in him to make a joke. He felt as if every drop of water in his body had evaporated from the heat. Opening his tired eyes, he could see a few places in the museum had started to catch fire, random paintings and artifacts starting to go up in flames. You know, maybe the reason you're not number one is because you do this to people. He laughed lightly, taking another moment to breathe. What did you say? Torrent after torrent of flame hit the pillar over and over again making Peter brace against the heat that was so near his burnt skin. Maybe he should have stayed quiet. It just hurt to talk. He didn't know if it was the burns or what. It just hurt. Might as well keep the show going. Quickly reloading his web shooters, Peter dug into one of the pouches in his belt and pulled out a small red and silver disc. His new web grenade design. He placed it in between his middle and index fingers, jumping out from behind the pillar and throwing it at the man's feet watching him get stuck to the ground in an explosion of silk. Damned brat! Endeavor launched himself into the air with a boost of the fire jets at his feet, shooting more and more fireballs beneath him and at Peter. Peter tried to flip out of the way but got graced by a good few of them before he found cover again. In a panic, Peter threw the black bag off of his back and began to put out the flame it had caught. Seeing the bag now extinguished, Peter threw it back over his shoulder and slid down the wall he was behind. A small breath came out of his mouth as he hung his head low. It was obvious he was starting to slow down. And to only prove that point further, his eyes trailed down to a pretty bad burn on his thigh he must have just gotten. This wasn't getting better. A few cracking noises reached his ears, but Peter could tell it wasn't from the wall he was hiding behind. Looking up, Peter groaned into the sky. A few of the columns that went up all the way up to the ceiling have begun to crack, threatening to collapse. Just his luck. Grabbing some cement webbing out of his backpack and loading them into his left web shooter, he shot a web at a stable part of the ceiling and began to swing. Shots of the gray silk stuck to the weak spots of the structure, quickly drying and reinforcing the cracking stone as Peter swung and jumped around the museum while dodging spears made out of flame. A part of him wanted to try to talk to him, you know? Try to get through to the man to save the museum from collapse. Peter knew the guy wouldn't listen, so he wasn't even gonna try. In his head, the sensation of his spider sense ringing drowned out his thoughts mid-swing, giving him barely enough time to shoot another web to pull himself out of the way of a flying endeavor. The man hovered in the air through the jets of fire at his feet. A couple beads of sweat could be seen on his forehead before evaporating. At least Peter was wearing him down. Shooting a web at the man, the masked teen pulled him in a dive kick that knocked the flying hero to the ground, crushing a glass case for some sort of replica of an All Might costume. Oh, that had to be some sort of irony. Also, he was pretty sure a few of those glass shards cut him right there. Which hurts. A lot. God, today was just the worst. More the reason why museums sucked. Do you think he could leave a bad Yelp review because of this? He sure hoped so. His eyes widened at the vibration at the back of his skull, the sensation giving him enough time to backflip off of Endeavor before he could be engulfed in a pillar of fire. He landed in a crouch, trying hard to think of what to do. Crap. What does he do? With his opponent on the ground and quickly getting up, what was the plan? Did he even have a plan? With a strong jump, Peter leaped into the air and shot two webs at the ground next to Endeavor, pulling himself back down and bringing the man to the ground again. Hey, can we take a small break? I'm really tired and it's getting hard to stall for my teacher to get here. 
Peter gave a wobbly smile that was partially seen through his torn mask. Endeavor glared at the boy with a burning hatred in his eyes, shooting a fireball from his shoulder which made Peter lean away from it before he grabbed the teen by the neck. Peter gasped, clawing at the hand around his neck as he felt it slowly heating up bit by bit, Endeavor simply scowling at him in silence. Quickly, the heat became unbearable, making Peter scream in pain and start to thrash around. The man simply tightened his grip. God, did this hurt? Desperate, Peter began to kick his opponent in the ribs with as much strength as he could use without actually killing him, making him drop the boy to the ground with a groan of pain. As he laid there, looking up at Endeavor holding his side as his scowl grew, Peter could only sigh and stare at the ceiling. Anyone ever tell you that the fire beard makes you look dumb? He coughed, feeling his lungs and muscles burn. He was just so damn tired. As he laid there, looking up at Endeavor holding his side as his scowl grew, Peter could only sigh and stare at the ceiling. Anyone ever tell you that the fire beard makes you look dumb? He coughed, feeling his lungs and muscles burn. He was just so damn tired. Even so, he wasn't finished. His lenses looked around his general area, passing over knocked over and destroyed artifacts and paintings, small fires that were slowly growing larger and larger, and the pile of still unconscious villains he had webbed to the ground before he found something. It looked like a pretty good replica of Captain America's shields simply lying on top of random rubble and debris. Might be useful. At least he hopes it will be. Because if you hadn't noticed, Peter had run out of options a bit ago. Quickly, Peter shot a web line that connected to the red, white, and blue shield, yanking on it and hitting Endeavor in the head with it. The loud clang echoed across the museum as the man stumbled backward while holding the spot the shield had hit, with Peter simply pulling the shield into his arm. All right, hopefully this stuff was made out of some vibranium. That stuff would be so useful to have right now. He threw the shield at a relatively intact wall next to Endeavor, making it bounce off of it before hitting the man in the chest and bouncing back into Peter's hand. Enough! I grow tired of your games, boy! With a snarl, he shot volley after volley of fire pellets at the masked teen, making him raise the shield in a panic. Given how the metal was starting to heat up more and more, he'd take a wild guess it wasn't vibranium. Lucky him. God did today just suck. Peter did his best to ignore the heat that came so close to his exposed skin, simply gripping the increasingly hot shield and throwing it at the man. As if seeing the attack coming, Endeavor grabbed the projectile with both hands before it could hurt him, creating flames in his palms as they both watched the shield melt. Yeah. It wasn't vibranium. God, he wishes he had a water bottle on him right about now. With a low growl, Endeavor shot forward in a tackle that Peter barely dodged, with a few of the flames on the man's shoulders gracing him. He shot a web at the man's back, with the hero turning around far quicker than Peter expected him to and grabbing the line, making it catch fire. Crap. I gotta ask, what's the plan? You're just gonna beat me up more? At this point, I feel like you're not even trying to arrest me anymore. A few of the flames on his face flickered and crackled in unison to the ones that burned around them in the museum. Endeavor only glared. Perhaps it would be best if I took you off the streets entirely, villain. Uh, that confirms it. He was probably gonna die today. Huh? Shit. His spider sense rang, allowing him to backflip away from another flame booster charge from his opponent, with him almost dodging the attack until his ankle was grabbed. That wasn't good. With a boost from a jet of fire coming from his elbow, Endeavor spun Peter around by the ankle until finally slamming him down onto the ground, cracking the floor. Ow. His vision was starting to go blurry and it was obvious that breathing would only be getting harder and harder to do as this fight went on. Man, could he even call it a fight? It has basically been him getting slapped around for. Crap, how long has this been going on? He just wanted to take a nap. The burns on his skin continued to sting and ache as he lay there, looking up at the hero he had just fought. It hurt, all things considered. If anything, a couple of them might be third-degree burns now that he thought about it. Even then, the burns weren't his only problem. His muscles had been screaming in agony and pain during this entire time, begging him to just stop fighting and lie down. And if that wasn't enough for him, his bones were probably in a lot more pain right about now. He guessed he had at least a few fractures right now. At this point, 
He wasn't even gonna try to get up. Why, you know? I always thought I'd go out saving someone. Peter began, coughing a bit as his lungs ached and screamed for air. Not looking at some guy in a midlife crisis. If he was gonna go out, he better go out annoying whoever does him in. Still holding his side with one arm, Endeavor pointed the other one down at the boy with a scowl growing on his face. Peter saw the guy was about to speak. A part of him told him it would be some sort of drawn-out, hammed-up speech about villainy. Now, were this anyone else, he would probably listen to it. Nah, he'd probably space out. But right now, he could barely keep his eyes open. And you could bet that Peter would not use the last bit of his strength listening to that stuff. Not for Endeavor, at least because right now, Peter was just tired. Not angry at how he'll die young. Not sad at how he won't be able to help more people. Not anything like that, no. He was just tired. Dude, if you're gonna start talking about self-righteousness or whatever, just don't and get this over with. Peter said quietly, sweat pouring down his face and sticking his torn mask to his skin. And do me a favor and ditch the stupid fire beard. A low snarl escaped his lips, his hand shaking in anger toward the boy looking up at him. Farewell, Spider-Man. Flames flickered at his palm, just about to shoot out and engulf Peter, with him simply closing his eyes and waiting for the inevitable, only for the fire to suddenly go out, making both of them make noises of confusion. It was as if his quirk was erased. If Peter had the energy right now, he'd be laughing. That is enough. The enraged voice of Aizawa echoed through the trashed museum, making everyone near freeze. There were a few of the red-haired man's sidekicks urging him to come back outside, but they too froze when they saw the state Peter was in. What is to dash? Endeavor began before being cut off by the underground hero was steadily making his way to the battered body of his student. You will not say another damned word. I don't care if you're the number ranked two hero or not. You will not lay a damn finger on my student. He growled, picking up Peter's body into his arms in a gentle manner. Peter couldn't help the sigh that escaped him, his spider sense finally ceasing its ringing in his head and letting him hear the world around him. Endeavor glared at the shorter man, the crackling of flames and camera flashes from outside being the only sound in the silence. Excuse me, your student? And who the hell are you? Protecting this villain from me and interfering in my hero work. He growled, the flames on his face rising in his anger. Aizawa growled right back at him, activating his quirk and making the fire on the taller man's face go out. I am Shota Aizawa, the underground hero eraser head and a teacher at UA. I am the homeroom teacher of this 15-year-old boy who you just nearly killed. A 15-year-old whose charges of vigilantism have been dropped now that he attends my class. He snarled, watching as Endeavor's eyes widened in shock at Peter's age. Peter coughed in Aizawa's arms a bit of blood coming out of his mouth and only making Aizawa glare harder. His name is Peter Parker, and I can assure you he is no villain. He, along with my three other students that were also caught in the middle of the heist, was crucial in evacuating civilians and apprehending villains, which was what he was in the middle of doing before you showed up. His statement was only met with silence, the tired-looking man letting his quirk detective as he exhaled through his nose. Believe me, Endeavor, what you've done today will not be swept under the rug and thrown aside like all the times you have killed criminals. I promise I will make sure of it. With that, Aizawa turned around with Peter still in his arms and began to walk to the ambulances waiting outside. A small smile graced Peter's face, the boy still not opening his eyes. Hey, scarf man, how you doing? His quiet greeting was met with silence, making Peter give a small frown. Way to go Mama Bear right there. By the way, he chuckled weakly as he felt the tension in his body start to fade and his consciousness slip away. Do not expect to be off the hook, Parker. Do you really have to give me a hard time, man? Can't even cut me some slack after Endeavor almost killed me. Even as the world slipped away into darkness, he could feel the small smile on Aizawa's face. If he does wake back up, he'd never let him live it down. Hey, can I... Take a small nap, please? I'm like, so tired right now, he asked. Just make sure you wake up, kid, Aizawa said softly, walking down to the stairs of the museum entrance. 
You're not getting rid of me that easily, man. He joked, feeling as his last bits of grip on consciousness fade. Peter was out before Aizawa got him in the ambulance, with the man riding alongside him. The vehicle sped away toward the nearest hospital, Endeavor watching it go as reporters all around him took pictures and asked question after question about the fight. Even if he was unconscious, Peter couldn't help but reflect a bit on all that had happened. A heist, learning about some criminal empire, and almost getting killed by Endeavor? Man, what a day. All he could see around him was darkness. It felt as if he had been floating there for ages. He was so thirsty. When was the last time he drank some water? Also, where even was he? All right, let's try to backtrack a bit. There was the field trip, then the heist that he and his class had to stop, which then lead to him going back into the museum to save that one girl from that southern dude and then Endeavor SHO, right? Endeavor. Wait, was he dead? No, he couldn't be dead. Aizawa showed up and saved him last minute. He did all that protective teacher stuff then carried him to somewhere he didn't really remember. God, did his everything hurt right now? Pretty sure that was a sign he wasn't dead given how he could actually feel things. Kinda crazy to think he was still kicking after a one-to-one -one fight with the number two hero though, although saying he was still kicking would be an exaggeration. Man, for all he knew Aizawa showing up was some sort of hallucination caused by his dehydration. Oh, that would suck. I might as well wake up and find out. If he was dead, he swears he's gonna haunt the hell out of Aizawa. From the darkness he was in, the world changed into one of blinding light as Peter sat up in the bed he was in while coughing. Almost immediately, a glass of water was present to him, making the boy snatch it from whoever was holding it and drink it all in one guy. So much better. Peter felt someone grab the now empty glass in his hand, with Peter letting himself fall back down onto the bed. He let out a few tired breaths, thanking whatever deity there was above that, he actually got something to drink before he looked to the side and at whatever was next to him. A small smile graced his lips. Hey, scarf man. Aizawa was sitting on a chair next to his bed, glass in hand and looking at him lazily. Glad you're awake, kid, the man told him, getting up and putting the glass on a nearby table before sitting back down and lacing his hands together. How are you feeling? You weren't expected to wake up for about a few more hours. Oh, that? I heal kind of fast, but I'm feeling really tired right now. Also, where am I? Aizawa raised an eyebrow at him as if it were obvious. A hospital? Where else do you think you're at? Wait, hospital? Crap. Peter shot up in his bed in a sudden panic. Aizawa rising from his chair and pushing him back down. You put me in a hospital? I can't afford that. Man. Dude, I would have healed just fine overnight. How am I supposed to pay for this stuff? Hearing this, Aizawa sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose in frustration before letting go of his student. Parker, you're in Japan. As in you have free health care and don't need to pay for hospital bills. Oh yeah, man, he forgot about that stuff. Sure came in handy. Oh right, yeah, I uh, knew that. Of course, I did. Peter chuckled awkwardly falling back letting his head hit the soft pillows. He raised his arms in front of his face. A few spots were covered in bandages that he guessed were spread all over his body. Since, you know, endeavor and all. Next time he swings by the support studio, he'd have to make his suit more fireproof. Like, a lot more fireproof. So, mind breaking down all the stuff that happened while I was out? After the part where I beat Endeavor. You almost got killed by Endeavor. Hey! I got a bunch of hits in, which was true, Peter absolutely had that guy on the ropes. Just don't ask anyone that. Aizawa sighed, sitting back down and running a hand through his hair. After your little fight that happened nearly three hours ago, you were treated for several burns ranging from second to third degree, major dehydration, along with a decent amount of fractures all over your body, and he's been through worse. The doctor said that few of those burns will undoubtedly scar but are in places where you can easily hide them with clothing, so you don't need to worry about that. Aside from that, you're gonna be fine physically. Man, more scars? Just what he needed. He has a few burn scars, all around his lower back. Guess adding a few more wouldn't hurt. At least he can hide them. Parker, the man's stoic voice caught his attention, making him look up from his bandaged arms. Are you gonna be alright? 
Peter only raised an eyebrow, running a hand through his hair subconsciously. I mean, yeah, you said I'll heal up fine aside from a few more scars. Why do you ask? Just as he said that, Peter realized something. Aizawa was talking about being fine on a physical level, wasn't he? You know what I mean, Parker? Aizawa leaned forward in his chair. Peter barely noticed how his eyes softened slightly. I think I will be, you know? Like, of course I was scared. I was terrified. Being some first year and having the number two hero kill you is... Messed up. Really messed up, but I'll be fine. The teen exhaled through his nose, sitting up on his bed once again and looking down. Guess I just accepted the possibility at around the start of that whole thing, dying right there, that is. But it all turned out fine, so... Does it really matter? I'll take some time later to think about it. The hospital room was silent for a moment, Aizawa sighing and sitting back. Do you want to talk about it? I dash, Peter began before stopping himself, thinking the question over quickly before sending a small smile at his teacher. No, not right now at least. Aizawa looked at him for a moment before nodding, letting the room fall back into peaceful silence. Suddenly, his spider sense buzzed softly at the back of his skull making him look toward the door to the room which then made his teacher do the same out of curiosity. Right on cue, the door slid open and revealed a green-eyed woman with brown hair that was around her early forties. She looked frantic when she first appeared before calming down. May Parker, way faster than Peter thought his aunt could move, one second she was at the door and the other she was at his bedside with her arms wrapped around him. Hey, May, Peter greeted, hugging her back. You all right? May pulled back and started to run a hand through his messy hair. Peter could see a few small tears in her eyes. All right, Peter, your school called me saying there was a heist at the museum your class was visiting and that then Endeavor nearly killed you. No, I'm not all right. Oh, I'm just Dash, cutting herself off. May began to hug her nephew once again, but a tiny bit tighter. Peter didn't protest. He knew May needed this right now. Besides, he needed it too. A few minutes passed with May checking over her nephew as if to reassure herself he was still there, with Peter simply holding her until she calmed down. Clearing his throat, Aizawa brought both Parker's attention to himself as he stood up from his chair. Mrs. Parker, I am Shoda Aizawa-Dash, he began, offering a handshake before being cut off. Oh, I know who you are. May smiled sweetly at the man and shook his hand. Peter always tells me about you. You're that underground hero, right? His homeroom teacher. The man in front of her paused for a moment, looking over at Peter before nodding. You wouldn't believe how much he looks up to you. Every time he called to tell me about his day, he would always mention you a dozen times. It is a pleasure to meet you, Aizawa. I can't thank you enough for what you've done for my nephew. He wouldn't be where he is today if it weren't for you. If there was a moment that Peter wished that Endeavor had actually killed him, it would be this one. May, don't tell him that stuff. That ruins our whole dynamic. Peter protested, only earning a laugh from his aunt while Aizawa held a look that said he was unsure as to what to do. Seriously, why would she say that? Their whole thing was that Peter annoyed Aizawa but they secretly liked each other to a point. You can't just say that it ruins it. Aizawa took another moment before ending the handshake and clearing his throat changing the subject to bring them back on track. As I was saying dash, suddenly, Aizawa took a step back and bowed low in front of the woman, making both Americans raise an eyebrow. I want to deeply apologize for letting Parker get injured under my watch. I would like to take responsibility and blame for what occurred today. I dash, he was about to keep going before being cut off by the woman in front of him, while Peter simply watched on in astonishment. Never in his life has he heard Aizawa actually apologize for anything now that he thought about it. Made him look as if he actually had moods outside of annoyed and tired with the occasional grumpy. Oh, please don't do that. May began, making the man stand up straight again as to meet her eye. I can't blame you for things out of your control. It was a case of wrong place, wrong time. And besides, May looked over at Peter with a small, fond smile on her face and soft eyes Peter could see through her glasses while she turned the golden ring on her finger with her hand. That was the ring Ben gave her. Peter wants to help people just like his uncle would have wanted, and from what the principal told me, he did just that. Being a hero is a dangerous job, 
no matter how much I wish it wasn't. But that's what Peter wants to do in his life. Holding you accountable for him getting hurt while helping others isn't what he'd want, so I won't. Peter wants to help people just like his uncle would have wanted. And from what the principal told me, he did just that. Being a hero is a dangerous job. No matter how much I wish it wasn't. But that's what Peter wants to do in his life. Holding you accountable for him getting hurt while helping others isn't what he'd want. So I won't. Oh, that was probably one of the most profound things he's ever heard. Man, he's forgotten how wise May was since they've been apart so long. Suddenly, his aunt gained a look of pure disdain in her eyes, looking over Peter's injuries once more before meeting Aizawa's eyes. Endeavor is the only one I hold responsible for what happened today. That man nearly and wrongfully killed my nephew and Dash. Her hands were bald and shaking fists, Peter putting a hand on her shoulder as to calm her. I just hope he faces consequences. Wait, what was going to happen with Endeavor? It's not like they could sue him since they didn't have enough money for that, so taking legal action directly was out of the question. The guy had to be facing at least a bit of backlash, right? I mean, he attacked a teenager only because he used to be a vigilante. The hold up. If Endeavor made a statement about his reasonings, then he'd definitely talk about how Spider-Man was attending UA. As far as he knew, the public didn't know that yet. If anything, UA would be facing backlash. Uh, Aizawa? Both adults in the room turned to face him. If Endeavor makes a statement, wouldn't he reveal to the public about how Spider-Man was attending UA? I, I don't want to bring you guys bad press or anything. Peter didn't want UA to get trashed just because he was going there and because of his past. That'd just be unfair to both of them. They have given him a second opportunity to help people the right way and for them to get trashed because of him. That just wasn't right. That was already taken care of an hour after you arrived at the hospital. Aizawa said, grabbing a remote from a nearby table and turning on a TV hanging on the wall. After changing a few channels, the TV displayed Nizu holding some sort of press conference in front of UA while camera flashes went off in front of him. The animal simply showing a polite smile and standing behind a podium with paws behind his back. When looking beside him, Peter nearly busted out laughing when spotting Aizawa, wearing a full suit with his hair tied into a neat ponytail. They probably forced him to not look like a hobo, now that he thought about it. Thank you all for coming to our press conference. We will be discussing today's events of the number two hero, Endeavor, wrongfully attacking and nearly killing one of our first-year hero course students. Nizu began, calling in a reporter with the head of a blue gecko with his hand raised. Nizu, reports say that Endeavor attacked the student due to him believing that he was the vigilante known as Spider-Man and that he was working with the villains conducting the heist. Is it true that Spider-Man attends UA, not missing a beat? Nizu simply smiled and nodded his head. While we will not disclose his identity, Given he is underage, we will confirm that he does attend our first-year hero course as a deal made with both us and the police to make up for his crimes of vigilantism and to get the charges dropped. Just like that, Peter watched as every single reporter presented erupted out of their seats, demanding answers to each of their individual questions. You didn't tell them who I was? Peter asked Aizawa, the man only shaking his head. You're a minor. We aren't legally allowed to do so without your permission. And I doubt it's in your best interest to announce to the world who you are right now. Peter could only sigh in relief that his identity was still intact and mutter out a thank you. He didn't want to deal with all of that anytime soon. Just the idea of being recognized as Spider-Man while walking down the street made him uncomfortable. You know? A few moments passed before Nizu called on another reporter. This one simply having a high ponytail. Nizu... Do you truly believe that this former vigilante should be given a second chance? ID Dash, before she could even finish her question. The white-furred animal quickly cut her off without even dropping the polite smile he had. He was and still is a young man in need of guidance who wants to help people. And we at UA pride ourselves in giving that guidance to aspiring heroes of all backgrounds. I myself believe he did less harm than he did good with most dismissing his good deeds on the simple basis of the circumstances they were done. His heart warmed at someone defending him. The only times anyone ever defended Spider-Man was in the occasional online forums that talked about him from time to time. It felt nice, you know? Having someone believe that what he does is good was probably the most he could ask for. Seemingly not done, 
Nizu placed both paws on the podium and continued his statement. Not only that, but he along with his three other classmates that were at the museum during the heist helped their teacher apprehend villains and rescue civilians, most likely preventing many injuries. The conference was silent for a moment bar the sound of camera flashes before people collectively started to ask questions again. Nizu decided to call on a woman with red lines going across her face that contrasted her sky blue hair. Excuse me, but how will you respond to Endeavor? He has been unavailable for comment ever since the incident. So we would like to see what you have to say about him. Peter almost missed it, but he clearly saw Nizu's eye twitch for a split second making the scar going down it scrunch up for a moment. Clearing his throat, Nizu waited for the room to fall into relative silence before speaking. Even through the screen, Peter could still feel Nizu's disdain that was hidden behind those beady eyes and polite smile. I, along with UA's teaching staff, are deeply disappointed and incredibly disgusted that one of our former alumni could have been involved in an incident in which he would nearly kill a 15-year-old. We will not be accepting recommendations for students from him from this point on, and I would like to offer my apologies to the family of the student he attacked. Thank you for coming today. With that, both Nizu and Aizawa bowed and walked off. Reporters all around then exploded with questions when Nizu mentioned his age before the cameras were cut and the screen went black. Peter looked at his election on the black TV screen before finally breaking his silence. Just like that, you guys didn't face backlash or anything because of me. Aizawa looked at him for a moment before shrugging lazily. Nizu deliberately scheduled the press conference and wrote the statement as to change the public's opinion on your past actions. No one in their right minds would side against a kid that was nearly and wrongfully killed by the number two hero. What? Did Nizu manipulate the public so they would side with UA against Endeavor? Seriously? Peter asked with an incredulous look in his eyes only getting a lazy nod and a sympathetic smile from his aunt. Oh, Nizu was freaking scary, all right, I... Peter began, running a bandaged hand through his face as he looked for the words. Thanks for figuring out the whole thing, but could you guys give me like five minutes by myself? I need to make a call. The two adults in the room nodded, May giving him one last hug before she and Aizawa left Peter alone in his hospital. Sighing, Peter grabbed his phone that was next to him on a small table, dialing a number and closing his eyes. The line ringed twice before the boy heard a voice on the other end. Peter ran a hand through his heart and sighed again. Hey, Jonah, I need to tell you something important. Mindlessly switching through random channels, Peter groaned before finally dropping the remote onto his bed. Who knew hospitals would be so boring? Endeavor had yet to make any type of comment about the fight at the museum, but that still didn't stop the public from talking about it. If you were to look on Twitter, you would see how Spider-Man has taken up the first 13 trending spots, all of them having different opinions on the matter. Most people have been using the term hero or menace for the whole thing. Peter couldn't help but find it ironic. I mean, he did just spend an hour convincing Jonah to let him keep his job at the Bugle. The guy had softened up on Spider-Man when Peter told him why he did what he did. Even if he seemed like a prick most of the time, the guy wasn't that bad of a person. Opinions were split 80 20 for and against him, with people defending him given his age and how he was, turning over a new leaf, while supports of Endeavor had criticized him for resisting arrest and not explaining himself to him well, that was until the video of the fight got out. Now, at first, Peter had assumed this whole thing would just be two different people saying two different things with not much proof against each other, you know? So imagine his face when someone has apparently leaked a video of Inside the Museum. And then imagine his face again when that person turned out to be the girl he saved from the shocker guy. Talk about convenient. Huh? Yeah, when people saw how things had actually gone down inside the museum, with Peter attempting to explain himself and only getting burnt in return, opinions changed a lot more. As in, it was now 95 to 5 for and against him. Still, Endeavor still had his supporters for whatever reason, but the general consensus was that he was in the wrong for, you know, nearly killing him and all of that stuff. Peter guessed the only people actually citing what endeavor on this were doing it solely for the fact that the guy was the number two hero. Believe it or not, there were a bunch of people out there who legitimately thought the top heroes could do no wrong. It was scary to see people actually thinking that. Even then, 
It made him uncomfortable seeing people analyze the video as if it was some celebrity drama instead of him fighting for his life. But that was the hero world, you know? Gave him all the more reason to keep his regular life private when he got a license. Letting himself fall back onto the bed, Peter continued to aimlessly scroll through random news feeds. Looked like the heist had taken a backseat to the fight when it came to public attention. Peter didn't like that. Crap. He forgot to tell Aizawa about the big man. Damn it, he'd have to do it tomorrow. Looked like the heist had taken a backseat to the fight when it came to public attention. Peter didn't like that. Crap. He forgot to tell Aizawa about the big man. Damn it, he'd have to do it tomorrow. Just as Peter was about to turn off the TV, his spider senses buzzed again and made him look towards the door that led to his room. Aizawa said something about having a meeting with Nizu and May had to leave quickly to run errands but would come back as soon as possible. The door burst open, revealing Najira, Togata, and Amajiki wearing casual clothes. Wait, did school get cancelled for them? No one told him that. Peter, Togata and Najira yelled simultaneously, running from the door and enveloping in a hug, awkwardly standing by the door and playing with the sleeves of his white hoodie. Amajiki jogged and joined in on the hug. Huh, that was kinda unexpected. But it was nice. Who knew group hugs were like this? And painful, maybe group hugs weren't a good idea when you have burns all over your body. Hey guys, this is really nice and all but could you let go? I'm kinda in a lot of pain right now. Peter laughed with a wince, hugging back for a moment before his friends let go. Najira was wearing a blue shirt with some cargo shorts. Amajiki wore a plain white hoodie, and jeans while Togata wore an awful Hawaiian shirt with cargo pants. Seriously, that shirt looked horrible. And he'd tell him later. So, how do I look? Peter asked, showcasing his bandaged arms. Like why you just fought Endeavor? Amajiki said, getting nods from both Najira and Togata. Like I just beat Endeavor. Najira deadpanned at him, pulling out her phone and playing a clip of him getting slammed into the ground. Yikes, that looked bad. Whatever, how are you guys? Peter leaned forward in the bed, watching as Najira began to flail her arms around. We were worried. You nearly got killed and stuff after we stopped the heist. It was crazy. Wait, have you seen the statement Endeavor did? Ahi dash, the girl began to ramble on and on about the public backlash that Endeavor was getting or something like that. Peter having tuned her out quickly. Besides, he could barely make out what she was saying. Wait, when did Endeavor even make a statement? Togata stood by and watched as Najira rambled on and on about something entirely different than before. Peter wasn't even sure what it was, before grabbing the remote on the bed and changing the channel. From a news report about some fight that Mirko had, the TV changed to Endeavor along with people that didn't seem like heroes wearing suits in a conference room while camera flashes went off. It happened like half an hour ago. Did you not know? We didn't watch it yet, cause we wanted to be there with you and all. Togata said, Amajiki nudged Najira and got her back on track. Hold up, they didn't watch it because they wanted to he there with him during it. Ah, that was so sweet. Either way, he should get back on track. Half an hour ago? Man, Peter needed to get better at keeping up with the news. Wait, he should probably pay attention to what was going on. Endeavor, now sporting a black eye that Peter didn't even remember giving him, cleared his throat to gain the attention of the conference room. Before we begin, I would like to say that I still stand by my actions and find them justifiable. What? There was no way, right? There was absolutely no freaking way that Endeavor was gonna start with that. No one would be so. Peter didn't even have the word for that. It was as if the guy was trying to be a walking PR disaster. I arrived at the museum in response to the heist that was being conducted. And I assumed that when the prolific vigilante known as Spider-Man was on the scene that he was collaborating with the villains. I attempted to apprehend him peacefully, but he refused. So I had to escalate the situation. While I did not know of his age, I still stand by what I did for it is a hero's job to apprehend threats to the public. The conference room was silent for a minute before people finally started to ask questions again, with the hero calling on someone with a reptilian-like face. Endeavor, in the video of the fight that a bystander took, it is clear that Spider-Man was trying to explain himself to you in an attempt to not have a physical altercation. Attempts that you were shown to clearly disregard in favor of attacking this young man, what do you say to that? The reporter asked, 
pushing his glasses back. Silent for a moment, Endeavor scowled before answering. I disregarded his claims of being on a UA field trip since I believed that the staff of UA would be above allowing a lowly criminal to walk its prestigious halls. But I suppose that it has lost its values in recent times, for the UA I attended would never do such thing that clearly betrays everything it stands for. Lowly criminal? This guy was just trying to be hurtful at this point. Also, did he really pull a back in my day? Peter had expected many types of responses from him, but that wasn't one of them. Maybe his joke about the midlife crisis during the fight wasn't too far off. Calling on another reporter, this one seemingly having a second set of eyes on her forehead. Endeavor exhaled through his nose in a sign of clear annoyance. Peter wholeheartedly believed that the guy didn't even want to be there at this point, as if the HPSC or his PR team forced him to do the conference. But that would imply that he did have a PR team, which would, in turn, imply that he cared at all. Yikes, how has this guy been so high up in the rankings for 20 years straight? The woman sat up from her seat, displaying the pin on her shirt that said, Daily Bugle, before beginning. Excuse me, but how do you respond to those that say you did more harm than you did good when you responded to the incident at the museum? Reports state that the UA students along with their teacher have already apprehended all villains and evacuated all civilians except one. A civilian that Spider-Man was in the middle of rescuing before you arrived on the scene and proceeded to endanger her life with reckless use of your quirk and caused millions of yen's worth of property damage. Huh, Jonah sent the good reporter out for this one, huh? Endeavor snarled, a few flames appearing on his face seemingly unconsciously. Collateral. Damage. I prioritize the apprehension of the immediate threat in all cases I am involved in. This one is no different. Were I in the same situation, I'd repeat the course of action I took to handle the situation. The conference room was stunned silent at the hero's declaration, with Peter being no different. Jesus Christ. Endeavor wasn't even a PR disaster at this point, it was like a PR dumpster fire. At first, Peter would make jokes about it, you know? But now, he just didn't even have words to describe it. Sharing his current state, the men in suits sitting next to Endeavor looked at him with wide eyes. Faces displayed how horrified they were. A few covered their mics and began to try and talk with the man, their attempts being ignored. As the men sitting next to him kept trying to tell him something, Endeavor simply called on some woman in the crowd that had an antenna coming out of her forehead. Endeavor, sir, what do you have to say to Spider-Man and his family? I am sure they would like some sort of comment. The flames on his face burst into his full fire beard at the question, burning brighter than before as Endeavor glared at every single camera. I want him to know that he still is and always will be good for nothing criminal that always got in the way of real heroes like myself and I hope that his family is ashamed of raising such an individual. That a dash, just as his friends let out a gasp in reaction to the statement, Endeavor's mic was cut mid-sentence. The man looked around at the people sitting next to him in confusion and anger, with one of them standing up and grabbing his mic, we would like to apologize deeply to both the young man and his family for what has happened today. As a HPSC representative, I'd like to announce that Endeavor shall be suspended from active hero work for the next six months due to his actions, that will be all and thank you for coming. Both the conference room and the hospital room was silent as Endeavor attempted to protest this seemingly last-minute decision before everyone except him bowed and ushered him out of the room, reporters bombarding them with questions as the cameras were cut. Holy shit. Holy freaking shit. After a moment of silence, his friends looked at him in astonishment, with Togata being the first to break the silence. Did you just get the number two hero suspended? He asked eyes wide. I think I did, was all he could see as he stared blankly at the screen. A lone man sat in his office with his chair facing the window, overlooking the bustling Tokyo streets from several stories up. He laced his hands together, deep in thought of today's events just as the door to the room swung open, in walking a man of Italian descent with a scarred forehead. Spinning around in his chair to face him, the man placed his elbows on the desk and looked at his employee. Boss, I dash, the scarred man began, trying to explain before being cut off by a raised pale hand. I already know of the outcome of the job, Hammerhead. His voice was deep, echoing across the office. Given the incident with Endeavor, the heist has taken a back seat in the public eye and saved it from getting too much unwanted attention. 
Hammerhead raised an eyebrow, watching as his boss straightened the black tie of his suit. This is but a minor setback. We already have several operations in motion all over both Mizutafu and Tokyo. A small dent in income is nothing to worry about. Are you sure, boss? There were heroes there, what if one of our guys talked? Hammerhead man asked, only getting a low chuckle in response. Even then, they would have no way to connect it back to me. I am wise enough as to not disclose my real identity to the petty thugs I employ in my empire. Nodding, Hammerhead looked at the sitting man one last time before starting to make his way out of the room. Sure thing, big man. With that, he exited the room, leaving the pale man to sit alone as he watched the city below. And who knows? Maybe a certain someone will stay at UA now that Todoroki won't be a part of recommendations. We got to see Mei and Aizawa finally meet. I had fun writing their interactions, so I hope you had fun reading them. The idea of her embarrassing Peter in front of Aizawa was going to happen eventually. It was just a matter of when. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.